It all begins with the Prota, about to face the Scorpion King in the Great Desert. The monster quickly shows its great power and charges to attack. The Prota, a great swordsman, doesn't wait for the attack to defend himself and also rushes into the confrontation before the giant scorpion can hit him with its tail. With incredible speed, he starts slicing through the scorpion with great ease, as if it were paper, finishing it off in style. This was the conclusion of the final boss, eliminating the Scorpion King. After this great feat, the Prota contemplates what he should hunt next, since he had already defeated all the major monsters. He would probably end up bored for a while in the largest virtual MORPG in the world, Arena, the first in the world ranking, first in total character level, first in Colosseum points, the greatest to leave unprecedented records. Meligod was the Prota's nickname, who was already determined to leave the virtual world and return to the real world. That day, the Prota decided to permanently leave the game. His friend Quan, known in the arena as Young Chan, is surprised to learn that Kang, the Meligod in the game, has deleted his account. But the Prota doesn't understand his friend's reaction, as his decision now was to focus on the real world, and he knew he couldn't keep playing games forever. Quan, astonished, tells Kang that it was impossible not to be surprised because he was Meli God, the first place character, who had now simply disappeared. And if he had at least sold his items, he could have secured hundreds of thousands of reyes. While the Prota sipped his coffee, he only listened to his friend, not paying much attention. After Quan finished speaking, Kang stands up and says he made this decision because he didn't want to regret it in the future. As for him, games should be fun and not a way to make money. Quan, still not understanding his friend's attitude, then asks what he would do from that moment on. Turning his back, the Prota waves and says he's going to enlist in the army and inherit his father's business. Irritated, his friend calls him a spoiled idiot and says he shouldn't have worried about him. Time passed, leaving behind what he had said to Quan. The Prota remembers that someone, somewhere, once told him that life was unpredictable, and after two years working in a convenience store, he served a drunk man trying to buy red cigarettes. Friendly, Kang grabs a box of red cigarettes and asks if that's what the man wanted. The old man, irritated, calls him an idiot and says it wasn't that one. The Prota, not understanding, points to the cigarettes and asks which one it was, but at the same time, he thought about how much the man smelled of alcohol and looked like a goblin. The man pointed to the cigarette, indicating which one it would be. In these situations, the Prota compares annoying customers to the goblins in the game arena. The drunk man remained irritated, unsure of what he wanted. Kang, friendly, hid what he thought of the man. This was the Prota, currently working part-time in a convenience store, earning 40 reais an hour, something no one would have imagined the super-rich heir of Damsu construction would experience such a significant decline. The sudden decline began after returning from his military service with the company's bankruptcy. His father, the pillar of the family, became very ill. As a result, his family was mired in enormous debts, leaving him with no choice but to support his family. Kang's main food source was the expired foods from the convenience store, as he had to save as much money as possible to pay for his father's medical expenses and the family bills. The Prota always wondered how long he could live like this, and noticed he received a message from his old friend Quan, telling him to respond because he already knew everything and that friends existed to help each other in situations like the one he was going through. Kong, surprised that Quan hadn't given up on him despite their last argument, felt grateful for his friend. The Prota recognizes that it was actually him who started to ignore his friend after his family went bankrupt because he couldn't bring himself to contact Quan, thinking that talking to him would only make him feel more pathetic. While Kong remained unresponsive, his friend kept sending more messages asking if he was going to ignore him again, and that the reason he had messaged was that someone saw him working as a convenience store clerk. Even without the Prota replying, Quan wanted to know why he wouldn't go back to playing Arena. Kang read the messages, waiting to see what his friend had to say. Quan continued to say that Arena had been profitable lately, and if the Prota became a streamer or debuted as a pro player, it would be easy to make millions in the end. Quan said he just wanted to remind him that this was a legitimate option since Kong was the former top-ranked player. The Prota began to think that if he could regain his ranker status like back then, he might actually be able to make money with Arena. Kang was paralyzed by this suggestion from his friend, as it could be a great solution to his problems. The Prota went straight to the mall to find out the price of a virtual reality capsule. Seeing the price, he started to think that he had gotten his hopes up for nothing, as he hadn't realized the cost back then and had bought the capsule without a second thought. Now he realized that the device was very expensive, at least three times his current salary. Seeing how much money he had, 
Kang regretted deleting his account back then, as he now recognized how much of a waste his attitude had been. A young man, accompanied by a girl, approached the prota, and, being ironic, remarked that he didn't expect to find Kang there. The prota looked but didn't immediately recognize who they were, so he asked the guy, who was about his age, how they knew him. The young man said his name was Han Beck, and asked Kang if he didn't remember him. The prota looked at the guy and began to recognize him. Han Beck was the delinquent son of his father's partner, Mr. Jung. The young man told Kong how he, being the great son of the CEO of Damsu Construction, didn't care enough to even remember who he was. The prota was surprised by what Han Beck had just said. The young man, laughing, told Kang to relax, that it was just a joke, but it seemed like he was scared. The prota didn't like Han Beck very much, and thought about how he continued to be as annoying as ever, with an expression of displeasure at seeing him. The prota told Han Beck to finish what he came to do and go away. Still laughing, the young man replied that he would do exactly that because people like him usually shopped at the mall, and then he began to taunt Kong, asking how his bankrupt family was doing. The prota was paralyzed while Han Beck continued speaking, questioning whether he really had the money to be in a place like that. Kong turned to him, wanting to know how he knew about his family's situation. The young delinquent, sarcastic, asked the prota if his parents hadn't told him what happened with disdain. Han Beck said that what happened to Kong's family was all because of his father. Shocked to learn this, the prota, looking at the young man who had his hand on his shoulder, realized that it was Mr. Jung who betrayed his father. Han Beck, laughing, said that his father had worked for decades for the prota's father, so it was time for him to come out on top, and to put Kong down even more, he maliciously added that he heard Kong's father collapsed when he found out, and that now Kong should take care of him closely, as he wouldn't leave him alone on his deathbed. The proto was paralyzed while listening to all those taunts, and his first reaction was to punch Hanbeck in the face while cursing at him. While the young delinquent lay on the ground laughing at Kong, the girl with him screamed as the security guards arrived. The guards held the proto to stop him from attacking further, while he furiously told Hanbeck that the reason his father was in bed, and the reason his family was in ruins, was because of the Jung family. The young man just laughed while the girl, shouting, urged someone to call the police, as Kong was out of control, even though he was being restrained by the security guards. The prota shouted that he was going to kill Hanbeck, no matter what happened. After the commotion, Kang was expelled from the mall, left alone in the rain. The prota walked, reflecting on what he now knew, wondering if money was really that great, as Jung not only betrayed his family, but also bragged about it as if it were a point of pride. As Kong walked past people who didn't understand why he was in the rain without an umbrella, he was determined to get his revenge, but at the same time cried, thinking about how he would be able to take revenge when he had no power now to do anything. Then he noticed that on a TV next to him, a host was talking about a streamer who recently signed a contract for 2,500,000 and, on top of that, apparently had already earned millions streaming arena, which was a lot of money. The prota began to come to terms with reality, and started paying attention to the news. The host continued to say that Arena was currently having a bigger impact than imagined on the economy, with the emergence of various jobs related to Arena. The proto realized once again that going back to playing could help him at this moment. Feeling neither shame nor pride, his body simply moved on its own. Kong began to call Quan, even though he hadn't responded to him before. His friend answered and said it had been a long time since they had spoken, and asked why Kong hadn't replied to his messages. The prota apologized to his old friend for calling him out of the blue. Quan, who was at home, became concerned and asked if something had happened. Kang wanted to know if he could help him because he was determined to return to playing Arena. The next day, at the company that created Arena, an ecstatic employee told the manager that something grand had just happened. Melee God had returned to the game. The man told the manager that a character had just been created using Melee God's user information. The manager didn't understand the excitement, as he didn't know who this player was and couldn't even pronounce the name, asking his employee who Mailgoat was. The man clarified that the pronunciation was Mailigod, the perfectionist. The manager then remembered the great number one player, but still didn't give it much importance, thinking he was just a player from two years ago and shouldn't care, telling the man to get back to work. A woman who had been listening to the entire conversation was curious about Mailigod, so she asked someone to provide the status report of the character that was in the tutorial at that moment. The tutorial NPC, Al, who was astonished, stated that the character Kang, who was currently in the tutorial, had just finished the magic power test, and to be honest, he had just set a new record in the application of the magic power test. The prota, focused on his objective, asked Al to give him the next test quickly, 
as Arena was the only way Kang could change his situation. So be it. He was going to become a ranker again. The Prota was at Quan's house, which had a simulation capsule just like the one he wanted to buy at the mall. His friend said he could use the capsule until he stabilized himself. The Prota, recognizing how kind his friend was being, said that even though he didn't have the right to say that, he promised he would reward him for everything. Quan playfully punched Kang and told him not to be so depressing, as they hadn't seen each other in years. And with a smile, he added that the Prota better not dare to disappear again. Inside the game, Kang, holding a sword, stood before a gate, already prepared, and asked Al to start the test. The NPC said that, according to his record, she would give him a level 10 test. The Prota was a little scared, as it had been a while since he fought in the arena. After starting the tutorial, Kang faced a warrior. The Prota remained calm, as he expected something stronger for his level, but he was only supposed to defeat a level 10 dark elf warrior. With his eyes closed, Kong began to concentrate, thinking that this wasn't a bad place to start, but he shouldn't get too excited, so he needed to control his breathing. Al was scared, watching the Prota with his eyes closed, while the warrior was already beginning to move to attack him. Seeing the elf approach, the NPC shouted at Kang that the tutorial had already begun. The creature, about to strike him, told the Prota that it was a mistake to close his eyes. Immediately, Kang opened his eyes and defended against the attack, saying he didn't think it was a mistake to have his eyes closed. Al was surprised to see that a level 1 user had blocked the attack of a dark elf warrior. Looking at his sword, the Prota realized that it had been so long since he had simply defended against an attack without thinking about the level difference, and he felt satisfied to know that it still worked. The reason he had managed to reach first place as melee god was that no one could match his level of control. The elf grew irritated with the Prota, as he couldn't hit him despite being stronger and faster. The creature also noticed that Kong's attacks were becoming sharper. The Prota began to remember the conversation he had with Quan, who, after hearing everything that had happened to his family, offered his house for Kong to live in, as the first months would be difficult for him. He also thought about the gratitude he felt for his parents, who always supported him, his despair over how his father was doing, and his desire for revenge for what Hanbeck had told him. The Prota managed to defeat the elf, keeping his goals and the will to repay everything in mind, ultimately beheading the elf. Kang was determined to do this in an unimaginable way, becoming a ranker in the arena with incredible speed. The woman who was monitoring the tutorial became ecstatic upon seeing that a newly created character was able to defeat a level 10 dark elf warrior, showing an achievement better than expected. She was convinced that Melee God hadn't lost his skills. Al, unable to believe what she had just seen, congratulated Kong, who had his sword over his shoulder, and told him that the tutorial ended there. Moving on to the next stage of the game, the Prota encountered Del, the chief of the Aslan village, who asked if he was a new traveler passing through. Before the Prota could respond, Del said it was a pleasure to meet him, and showing a small chest, mentioned that it contained his reward for completing the test. It was a ring that held the spirit of a giant from mythical times, granting the wearer the strength and spirit of a giant. It had a unique rank with an effect of plus 50 strength, plus 50 constitution, minus the giant's strength, and its power increased based on stamina status for five minutes, with a recharge every two hours. The Prota was surprised by the unique item he had just received, recognizing that it was worth doing a level 10 test right from the start. Young Chan sent a message to the Prota, asking if he had finished the tutorial. Kang was surprised, as he hadn't expected a message from his friend. Young Chan sent another message saying he would ask for a ride to the East Gate. Soon after, Quan sent another message wanting to know if he could hitch a ride too. Kong replied that he needed to craft an item, so they would have to meet another time. Young Chan asked what item it was. The Prota said he wouldn't spoil the surprise and would show him later. Quan was happy to know that, even though Kong was just starting to play, his friend was already planning something. Kong then asked his friend if he could lend him 50 gold, as he had nothing. Young Chan, who was standing in front of a gate in another part of the map, wondered why the Prota wanted that money. In the past, there had been an item that all hardcore players used, nicknamed the Experience Potion. It was a popular item that increased experience gain by 20% for four hours. This potion was an extremely expensive item, sold for 300 gold per unit, but the supplier had disappeared, and the potion faded from people's memories, or so they thought, as it was the Prota who was the supplier. Smiling, Kang was still the only one who knew how to make the experience potion. So, if he sold them at auction, he could set whatever price he wanted. But there was a problem. The final ingredients were not dropping from the monsters. To obtain them, he would need other items, such as oak roots, 
which cost 2,344, dead tree sap costing 488 red rabbit fur, which cost 1,832, morning dew costing 3,212, and the first leaf of the Amira, which cost 10. They were too expensive for the prota to afford at the moment. With nothing else to do, Kong decided to go to the dungeon to collect these items. Upon arriving there, a guard told him he couldn't enter, explaining that this dungeon was now the territory of the Black Skull Guild and that it was no place for novices to be entering. After hearing the guard say that, the prota thought about who this guy was trying to prevent him from entering the dungeon, as it was the only place where he could get the final ingredient. Kang then told the guard to step aside while he was still being nice. The guard, staring at the prota, replied that since it seemed he had just started, he would let him go just this once. Kang ignored what the guard said and continued walking toward the dungeon, yelling at the guard to get out of the way because he was busy. As he walked, the prota noticed the guard put his sword to his neck. The man called him a novice and asked if he hadn't heard that he wasn't allowed to enter there. Kong, irritated, asked who was the novice and removing the guard's sword with his hand, stated that his life depended on this game and that he didn't want to waste a single second. Looking at the guard, the prota suggested they place a bet, with the stakes being a count deletion, against a novice. Since the guard was experienced, he wouldn't back down. The bet was character deletion. If he lost, his character would be deleted. But since there weren't many players willing to take such risks, it wasn't something that really happened. However, the player guarding the dungeon furiously accepted the bet and said that the novice would have to create a new account. But now the tradition of betting with character deletion was about to be born. The player, Kong, established the terms of the bet. The terms set were, the winner takes everything, including character deletion. The player park accepted the terms, so the duel was about to begin. The guard told the prota that now he couldn't escape while the countdown happened. Kang told Park he would finish him off in five minutes, activating his sword and continuing to say that he should say goodbye to his character. The guard became even more irritated with the prota, and with one second left in the countdown, he told Park not to be afraid, as he would hardly have a chance to fight someone like him again, so he could think of this fight as a lesson. After the countdown ended, a message appeared stating that the duel had begun. Park told Kang he would see how long he could keep bluffing. The prota immediately launched into an attack just as the guard finished speaking. Kong started with the first attack, but Park managed to dodge it. With relative ease, ready to counterattack, he said the prota wouldn't be able to keep up with his speed. With the agility of a novice, Park attempted to attack Kong, who managed to block the strike, which was nearly at his neck. The guard was astonished, not understanding how the prota had blocked his attack, and furious, he charged forward with everything as he could not accept a defeat, convinced that he had a much higher level than Kong, who remained calm, defending against the attacks. The guard began to wonder if the prota might have some item or something similar that allowed him to fight like that, but after some time in combat, Park realized that Kang was too relaxed to be a novice. He then deduced that the prota might be a player hunter disguised as a novice. Demonstrating calmness, Kong dodged the attacks, thinking about how simple they were, noticing that his opponent started to get nervous. The prota realized that the guard was full of openings, allowing him to land a blow that struck his opponent's leg. With his gaze fixed on Park, he noticed that he had disabled his pain sensitivity, as his reaction to the hit was minimal. This made the prota realize that it would be easier than he had thought. Activating the ring, his new item, the giant's strength was being utilized, temporarily boosting Kang's power. The game had turned. The prota seized the opportunity and began attacking his opponent with great speed forcing him to merely defend against the blows. Park was terrified, now being pressured by a novice. Looking at the prota in fear, he wondered who he could be, given his great combat skills. The guard was paralyzed, nearly devoid of any reaction. Kang noticed how defeated his opponent appeared and stated that he would start wrapping up the fight, having realized that Park was thinking about something else during the battle. The guard, seeing the prota prepare an attack that could end the fight immediately, thought about blocking it but his arms were covered in cuts from the attacks he had received, and his body no longer responded. Park merely looked on in horror as he saw the prota easily cutting his neck. After striking his opponent, Kong told him before his death that since he didn't feel pain, he didn't know the state of his own body. The victory message appeared, stating that the prota had won the duel and the rewards would be distributed according to the winner-takes-all rule. After the fight, Kong stretched while examining Park's inventory, which contained a bunch of items and he could now go after the final ingredient at Alan's workshop, where capsules maintained ongoing production work. There, items were produced in place of the players. However, 
This could not compensate for the player's lack of skill in crafting the items. The Prota lamented that he could only do this once a month, but he was glad to remember how the experience potion was made. It was complete. A rapid elder experience potion, created with an ancestral method, ranked uniquely, with an effect of increasing experience gain by 20% for four hours. Holding the potion, the Prota thought that now he should start profiting from that little beauty. Then that day, in the exclusive trading area of Arena, the Arena Shop, an absurd item was added. Players were astonished to see that experience potion up for auction. There was only one experience potion in the auction, and all the users rushed to the auction to get it. This resulted in an exponential increase in the potion's value. Six months ago, the maximum price of the potion was 3,000 gold, but it ended up selling for 5,000 gold. After receiving the money, the Prota walked, thinking that with this money, he could pay for his father's hospital expenses and his living costs, and still have around 2,000 gold left over. Each gold piece was worth about five reais, which was definitely better than working part-time at the convenience store. The Prota thought that if he were to become a streamer or a professional player, he would need to level up. To increase his combat power, the first thing he needed to do was level up and acquire equipment. So, he decided to spend the remaining 2,000 gold efficiently, buying more practical gear instead of aesthetic sets. The equipment, a leather helm with a low-ranking wind spirit, had a rare rank with no requirements, a durability of 200, defense of 35, and an effect of plus 15 agility, making the body lighter and slightly increasing speed. The red mole leather pants had a rare rank. With requirements, strength needed to be above 25, with a durability of 180, defense of 31, an effect of plus 10 in agility, and plus 10 in all stats when at least one foot was on the ground. The sharp longsword had a rare rank, requiring strength above 50 and stamina above 30, with a durability of 550, defense of 35, and an effect of plus 15 strength and plus 5 defense against piercing damage. Dell was impressed to see how much the Prota had changed since the last time he saw him. The man asked Kang if he had joined a cult. The Prota replied, no. People looked at Kang with disgust, commenting on how he was dressed, saying he looked like a walking traffic light. Hearing those taunts, the Prota became furious and flushed red, thinking about how stupid those people were, as utility was more important than appearance. Dell, alarmed, told Kang that his face was the same color as his pants and asked if everything was okay. The Prota responded that he had given him a mission. After getting a new mission, Kang found himself in another part of the map, now facing wild wolves that attacked him all at once. Even so, the Prota didn't feel intimidated and charged into combat, easily defeating the first creature with well-placed strikes. He began to feel lighter and thought it might be because his stats had increased. Fighting against several wolves, he now understood why those items had been expensive, and he no longer cared about fashion. He was focused on results. After defeating the wolves, a message appeared. Mission conditions met. Forest wolves killed, totaling 15 creatures. Wolf fangs, 15. Now he could return to Dell and receive his rewards. After knowing what he needed to do, the Prota concentrated and reminded himself that he wasn't playing the game for fun, he was betting his life. So every minute and second of his time was money. Now he needed to go to the Goblin Dungeon. The objective was to reach level 10 that very day. Upon arriving, there were several players in the area, but the Prota had expected that crowd at the Goblin Dungeon. A warrior approached Kang and said he was recruiting members for his team and was looking for melee players. The Prota stated that he fought in close range and asked if he could join them. The warrior accepted right away but began looking at the items Kang had and said that, on second thought, he should look for a group of novices, as it seemed he didn't have any immunity items and they were an advanced team. The Prota became furious to hear that he should seek a team of novices and told the warrior that even without immunity, he could easily avoid and handle a poisonous strike from a goblin. As he ranted, someone approached him from behind and asked if, by any chance, he had experience with the goblin dungeon. A female player said it was her group's first time in the dungeons, so they needed someone with experience, and if it wasn't a problem, she would like to invite the Prota to join their group. With all her charm, the player wanted to know Kang's response, and he was fascinated by her, saying he accepted and would carry her until the end, and she didn't need to worry about anything. The player then told her group members that she had secured the last member. The Prota looked at the group members, which included a warrior, an archer, and a mage. The player quickly introduced herself as a level 20 priestess named Choi. Next, the Prota began to introduce himself and said his new in-game name was Hyunwu, and that he was a level 20 warrior. He thought it was a good benefit of the arena system. It kept the user's status window private, 
as he was lying since he wasn't even level 10 yet. The next to introduce himself was a level 24 warrior named Jin, followed by a level 22 archer named Chiol, and lastly, a level 23 mage named Jia. Jin asked the prota if he would be fine hunting goblins without any defense items. Kong awkwardly replied that he had a good technique. Immediately, Choi told her group member that it was rude to say that to someone she had just invited, and it also showed that he didn't trust her. Hitting the warrior on the head with her staff, Choi told him to die already. Afraid, Jin said he didn't want to die because of her, so he wouldn't say anything else. The prota, witnessing the scene, just laughed. The priestess told Hyunwoo that he would soon see their abilities and then instructed everyone to enter the cave. Right away, they encountered a group of goblins that were armed and ready for combat. Jin, who was at the front of the group, told everyone to get ready, as this would be their first fight. The goblins began to attack, using slingshots. The warrior defended the group with his shield and told the rear guard to counterattack. The mage and the archer were ready and attacked together. Jia attacked using a magic arrow, while Chiel fired a double shot hitting some goblins and causing a large explosion. As the prota fought against the goblins in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he noticed that even though the group was very concerned about having a member with experience, they worked surprisingly well together. This left him wondering why they cared about accepting him as a member, but Kang quickly changed his mindset, realizing that what truly mattered was leveling up. After easily defeating the group of goblins, Jin asked Choi how long they had been hunting inside. Jia says that Hyunwoo performed very well. Laughing, Chiol asks the protagonist if he was using any good items, as his sword was making a whoosh and shoosh sound. Kong doesn't mention his item, and says he is just confident in his techniques. Choi wants to rest a bit after the duel. Jin tells the priestess that she was right. They needed to ensure everyone was prepared since they were about to fight the hobgoblin, as planned. The protagonist, listening to the warrior, asks the group if any of them has defeated the boss yet. Jin says that only he has defeated it. Hyunwoo begins to remember that a hobgoblin is quite difficult to defeat with a group of level 20, and it had been a long time since he had defeated one too. Jin was giving instructions to Choi. The warrior said he should pay close attention when giving buffs. He also tells Jia to be careful not to spend too much mana. As for Chiol, the warrior warns him to be careful not to shoot his allies. The smiling archer responds that he wouldn't make that mistake again. The protagonist is surprised to realize he could end up with an arrow in his knee. After the instructions and the group takes a break, they move forward as Chiel senses the presence of goblins. Jin and Hyunwoo stay at the back. They were already close to the room where the hobgoblin resided, along with a group of goblins. Before they invade the area, Jin tells the rear to take care of the smaller goblins while he and the protagonist buy time with the boss, reminding Choi not to forget to buff. The warrior, wielding his mace, gives the order for everyone to advance. It was time to raid the boss. As the group invaded the room, the priestess used her buff, increasing her group's strength and agility. Immediately, the hobgoblin orders his subordinates to attack the humans. The protagonist, along with Jin, easily defeats the first horde of goblins, but during the fight, Kong notices that the boss is using his ability to attack his companion. He quickly tells Jin to get out of the room, but there isn't enough time left. The boss used his magic on the warrior, who even while defending with his shield, was thrown back against the wall. The members could do nothing but watch. The protagonist is impressed to see that a mutant hobgoblin can use magic. He knew it would be problematic if the creature fired another dark orb. Hyunwoo decides he must attack the boss before he has the chance to use his magic again. The protagonist asks the rear to cover him, but Chiol and Jia are lost, not knowing what to do. Unlike Choi, who was healing Jin, who was already out of combat. While the protagonist killed the smaller goblins blocking his path to the hobgoblin, he couldn't understand why his group was just watching, completely forgetting the teamwork from before. In that brief moment, the boss was preparing his magic to hit Hyunwoo, who was astonished to see that the hobgoblin was already readying another dark orb, when suddenly, he noticed an arrow heading in his direction. With incredible reflexes, he managed to deflect the arrow's trajectory with his sword, sending it straight into the hobgoblin's eye. The protagonist is irritated by the situation, as he didn't expect Chiel to miss at such a crucial moment. The young archer apologizes to Hyunwoo, who starts to think that this group wants him dead or something, but he doesn't have time to think too much, as his priority is to deal with the boss in the mission who, even wounded, was charging at him with his sword. The protagonist feels confident, regardless of his level, as he is not the type of guy who would die to a mere hobgoblin. So, before the creature could hit him, Hyunwoo cuts off the boss's arm and immediately shouts for the rear to attack. Chiol and Jia are startled by the protagonist's reaction as they were focused solely on watching the fight. 
but they start using their abilities against the Hobgoblin, who can no longer defend himself, taking all the hits. The message appears, Boss defeated, you have eliminated the Hobgoblin from the cave. The mage is happy to see that they managed to defeat the creature. Choi, Chiol, and Jia, amazed, start saying that Hyunwoo was so cool and that he was the one who defeated the boss. The protagonist doesn't like this at all, watching those players act that way. The archer approaches Kong and awkwardly says that the arrow was just a mistake and nothing more. The protagonist, with a disapproving look, simply stares at him and says nothing. After the items are dropped, the priestess asks what they will do with all those items. Jia says that Hyunwoo deserves to keep all the items. There was a random pet egg, five silver coins, 28 bronze coins, and a magical book of dark orb. The protagonist notices that everyone in the group is looking at him with friendly expressions, but he is still afraid that they might try to kill him if he suggests keeping everything. Choi calls out to Hyunwoo, who isn't saying anything, just watching. The protagonist thinks about taking just one item and leaving. So he tells the priestess that he only needs the egg because the book is useless to him. The girl starts smiling and celebrating. The protagonist begins to say goodbye and backs out of the room, mentioning that he should leave because he has a lot to do. As he leaves, Chiol asks if he is going to hunt again, while Choi wants to know if they can send a friend request. The protagonist, leaving as quickly as he can, says they can do that next time they meet. Already outside the room where the group was, running, Hyunwoo thinks about how he couldn't relax because of all those backstabs, which seemed intentional to kill him. Now in the city, the protagonist opens the status window to see how he was doing. Hyunwoo was at level 10, with no titles, a strength of 20 plus 65, agility of 30 plus 25, condition of 15 plus 50, and magic of 25. The protagonist feels pleased to know that he has reached level 10 and can finally advance his class. In front of the class tower or advancement tower, each floor represents a different class where various items can be obtained, functioning like a convenience store. This place is mandatory for players who reach level 10. His new item, the random pet egg, could be a rabbit or a dragon, which after injecting mana, would hatch within an hour. Now that the protagonist knew how long it would take for the egg to hatch, he affirmed that it would be the necessary time to acquire a new class. Hyunwoo enters the tower and heads straight to the warrior floor, where he finds Director Khan, who asks if he really wants to become a warrior. The protagonist responds that he came there for just that. The director tells Hyunwoo that he is clever and likes his style. The protagonist knows that classes only become important from the second advancement onwards. Khan mentions that he is different from the filthy cheaters from the lower floors. He would decide if Hyunwoo would become a warrior in a battle. The protagonist thinks this type of evaluation is great. Then, the director grabs a sword and throws it to him. After throwing the sword, Khan says he will let the protagonist make the first attack, and he immediately gets into position. Then, the director tells him to go for it. Hyunwoo says he won't hold back and charges into combat. The protagonist strikes the first attack, which is defended by the director, who recognizes that the attack is sharp and that the boy has already gotten used to the sword. As the duel unfolds, Khan realizes that Hyunwoo is different from the other adventurers, showing he is good enough to be a warrior. The two engage in a great display of combat with fast, solid attacks. The director, using a bit more of his strength, knows that the protagonist is still a small adventurer who hasn't managed to get a decent class. Then, he uses a move that sends Hyunwoo flying back, but Khan doesn't stop attacking, and charging forward, tells the protagonist that he still has a long way to go to defeat him. But Kong is determined to be the best in the game. Using his hand for support, he delivers an impressive kick, blocking the director's sword, who is astonished at how he managed to perform that move. The protagonist remarks that he took a risk, but it worked out. Khan realizes that even after taking a hit, Hyunwoo had time to think about how to counterattack while dodging another strike, displaying a natural flow in his movements that doesn't follow traditional fencing. Seeing that the boy wasn't stopping and was already preparing a strike to attack him, the director acknowledges that the protagonist has a natural talent for combat. Khan halts the test and says that it is enough, as Hyunwoo has demonstrated that he is more than qualified. The protagonist stops the sword at the director's neck, and after retracting it, says he was just warming up. Khan tells Kong that he is incredibly skilled and knows how to recognize a good warrior. Then, the messages appear. You have advanced to warrior. Your strength and constitution have increased by 10 points. You have received the title of warrior, recognized by Khan, a title given to adventurers recognized by the strict class administrator with an effect of increasing melee weapon attack by 5%. The protagonist has also learned new skills, weapon mastery, increasing weapon attack by 10%, the dash skill, which allows a leap forward and attack with his weapon, and strike, 
which infuses his weapon with magic, allowing it to be swung with force. Hyun Wu feels pleased with the skills, recognizing that they are not bad, and also for having earned a title. The director throws something to the protagonist and says that, if it were him, perhaps it would be possible, receiving a new quest. Khan tells Hyun Wu that when he has total confidence in his strength, he should seek out the owner of that coin. The quest is, find the Knight of Kione. You have received the recommendation from the class administrator, Khan. If you are confident in your strength, speak to the Knight of Kione, Lebron, a rank E mission, with the objective, meet with the Knight of Kione and a reward, the ability of Kione. The protagonist remembers that this knight leads an army in the arena and is also the strongest knight in his empire. Hyunwoo is dazzled and asks again if the reward is the ability of the strongest knight in the empire. This is something incredible. Seeing how the protagonist reacted, the director begins to wonder if he made the right choice in giving the coin to him. Hyunwoo says he doesn't want to waste any more time, so he bids farewell to Khan and sets off on the mission. After leaving the tower, the protagonist reflects on how unexpected this was, obtaining a secret mission because he met a special requirement. But since it is a rank E quest, he needs to reach level 50 first. After opening the inventory window, he receives the message that the egg will hatch soon, with one minute and zero seconds remaining. For a moment, the protagonist had forgotten about the egg that was hatching. Excited about his lucky day, holding the egg, he hopes to get a unique pet, but thinks it's unlikely to be a dragon. The egg begins to hatch. The protagonist, nonetheless, hopes it will be a dragon. But then the unexpected happens. A small bear emerges, stating that it was the wrong answer, and it's not a dragon, but a cute little bear. Hyunwoo is in shock seeing that creature, as he never imagined it could be a small bear. The creature tells the protagonist that he seemed speechless at its lovely form. Hyunwoo is amazed to see that the pet can also talk. The protagonist starts to see this as a way to make more money, as a talking pet is something he had never heard of, so it could be a unique pet. Even if it wasn't, it was extremely rare. He soon thinks he could make a profit by putting on shows with it. Regardless of what he would do, the protagonist knows that this pet will bring him money. The bear climbs onto Hyun Woo's shoulder, holding onto his hair, and says that from that moment on, he would allow the human to serve him. The protagonist stands still. Then the bear slaps Hyun Woo on the head and asks what he is doing. The protagonist, unsure of what was happening, only had one certainty. Pulling the pet off his head, he says that the bear that hatched from his pet egg needed a lesson. Hyun Woo throws the creature to the ground with all his strength, creating a bump on its head. The little bear, crying on the ground, asks how the protagonist dared to do that to the heir of Buzzing Island, but still considers him qualified to be his master, though he warns that the girls will never like him. Hyun Woo punches the creature on the head and tells it to shut up. The bear, now with another bump on its head, states that it has encountered a violent master. After all that commotion, the protagonist opens the pet status window and notices that its skills aren't total trash, as it is level 5. The marionette bear has the title Heir of Buzzing Island, with a friendship level of 0, 15 strength, 15 agility, 30 condition, and 50 magic, and the skills Bear Spirit and Forest Blessing. The protagonist decides to name him Tangy. The bear gets excited and celebrates his name, apparently liking it very much. The creature, calling Hyunwoo Master, suggests they toast and eat something, but the protagonist bids farewell and says he was planning to log out. Tangy becomes furious, saying he has only been alive for a few minutes, and yet the protagonist is leaving him alone, making him start to think that he has a cruel master. Already out of the game, taking off his virtual reality headset, he takes a deep breath and tells himself that he had spent a good amount of time, almost the whole day, inside the game. His friend Quan opens the door and asks the protagonist what he accomplished that day. Kong replies that he got a class and a pet, which isn't bad at all. Quan is surprised to learn that his friend has already obtained a class and asks if it's not time for him to start preparing. Kang doesn't understand what he's talking about. Quan tells the protagonist that it's time to prepare for his debut as a streamer. Kang is left speechless, listening to his friend while sitting on his bed. He mentions having heard that streamers are well paid. Quan says he has something the protagonist needs to do. Kong doesn't understand and asks what it is. Quan explains that the protagonist needs to record the game every time he plays, as he plans to use those videos for promotion and post them on World Arena. The protagonist feels awkward after hearing what his friend says, thinking it's a very difficult task. Quan reassures him not to worry because he will be his manager, and if people hear that the former number one player has started streaming, they will obviously watch without stopping. The protagonist asks his friend why he seems more excited than he is, Quan, smiling, responds that he is very excited because it's the debut of Melee God, 
now Hyunwoo, whom they've been talking about, so how could he not be excited? A bit more motivated, the protagonist says he will try to meet his friend's expectations. In the game, in the western region of the Black Forest, Hyunwoo encounters a group of dark elf warriors. He tells his pet that it's their first fight together, and asks if he can expect a lot from him. Tangy replies that he can definitely do that. The protagonist says they will now start leveling up like crazy. The bear starts jumping and says he will cheer for him. Hyunwoo doesn't like the attitude of his pet, who is just going to cheer, but he realizes that he is starting to gain more strength. It's the bear spirit buff, with a rare rank proficiency F, which increases strength and constitution by 5% for 5 minutes, with a cooldown of 1 minute. While buffing his master, Tangy shouts for him to kill the elves. The pet also provides the forest blessing buff, with a rare rank proficiency F, which increases armor by 5% and recovers constitution by 0.1% every second for 5 minutes, also with a cooldown of 1 minute. The protagonist is surprised and asks Tangy if he is a buff pet and not a tank. Meanwhile, the elf charges forward to attack, telling the protagonist that he is a stupid human for lowering his guard right in front of them. Before the elf can strike Hyunwoo, he manages to hit the creature, showing that he hasn't lowered his guard at all. As the elf knelt, near death, the protagonist felt happy to have Tangy, as he hadn't been able to check what he could do properly. He didn't know that he could increase his strength, constitution, and armor, and also provide continuous recovery buffs. Now, the protagonist recognized that the pet was more useful than the buffers at his level, and while he finished off the other elves, he thought he liked Tangy more than he had imagined. Hyunwoo hadn't noticed yet, but there were more players in that area watching everything he did. They were planning to attack the protagonist after he dealt with the elves. The player observing Hyunwoo commented that he had wind armor and earth pants, implying that he must be a rich player who buys items. The warrior asked the observer, who turned out to be the leader, what concept they were going to use that day. The archer replied that they could pretend they were forming a new group. The second warrior, who appeared younger, said he thought it was a great idea to play the good guys and ambush the prey whenever they got the chance. The priestess was worried and told her group that there was a possibility that the warrior fighting the elves was someone's secondary character, as he seemed accustomed to fighting. The members of her group didn't understand why she was so concerned. The archer, laughing, said that nobody cared about that and that the average level of people in the forest was 20, so that warrior couldn't defeat them since they were at an average level of 40, and no one can win when outnumbered. The warriors in the group said that she was worrying too much, and it's not like they had done this just once. The woman felt awkward and apologized for saying that. Waiting for the right moment, they were determined that the protagonist would be their prey that day, and they were going to steal all his items. Hyunwoo took a deep breath after managing to defeat the group of dark elves. He began to watch the recording he had made with Tangy. Watching the video, the protagonist deduced that hunting dark elves didn't have much impact. His pet, calling Hyunwoo master, remarked that he was quite skilled in combat. The protagonist, irritated, held Tangy by the face and told him that he hadn't brought him along just to cheer from behind and that he was a master, not Master Little. The bear, calling the protagonist an idiot master, pointed out that he had buffed him before the fight. Even so, Hyunwoo told the marionette bear that since he had enough constitution points, he should at least create some distraction because the fight doesn't end because of a buff. While the protagonist was arguing with Tangy, the group of players who had been watching him approached, showing themselves to be friendly. The archer asked Hyunwoo if he was hunting alone and, if it wasn't too much trouble, if he could join their group. Holding his pet, the protagonist thought carefully about whether to join a group so soon, as his last experience hadn't been very good. He then started to analyze the player's items, putting on a friendly face. The archer mentioned that it was nice to see another player in the Black Forest, as hardly anyone went there. Still not answering, the protagonist assessed the group, which consisted of two warriors, an archer, and a priestess, appearing to be a well-balanced team. Hyunwoo began to find the invitation strange, since he wasn't even a mage. And besides that, it seemed that everyone had level 20 items, but there was a warrior wielding a sword that required at least level 40 to use. The protagonist started to deduce that the fact they were hiding their levels and approaching him could indicate that they wanted to PK him. But Hyunwoo had an idea immediately. If that group was planning to PK, he might have a good chance, so he asked if they really intended to let him join the group. Smiling, the archer said he was glad he agreed to join, but thought he had just picked up another idiot. He then introduced himself. The archer said his name was Ren, and that he always stayed in the back, while the two warriors were the vanguard of the group, Cal and Crawford, and the priestess was named Basil. Smiling, 
the protagonist introduces himself as Young Chan and asks the group to take care of him during the combat. His pet also introduces himself, saying he is named Tangy. The protagonist finds it strange to reveal his real name to the group. Meanwhile, in another part of the forest, Hyun Wu begins to attack a dark elf who easily defends against his attack. The group of creatures prepares for combat, realizing they were enemies. Seeing the furious elves, the protagonist hides behind Cal, leaving everyone confused about what he was doing, as he struck the elves and quickly returned to hide behind the warrior with a shield. This frustrated both Cal and the elves. One of the creatures tells the protagonist that he is a cowardly human for hiding behind Cal like that. Hyun Wu replies that the members of his group are strong, so it looks like he paid them to do this, and his skill proficiency was rising significantly, even giving a shout out to those who hunt in groups. An hour later, Cal becomes furious and asks what kind of guy Hyun Wu is, who keeps attacking and running back behind him as if he were using them. The warrior tells Ren that even when he attacks, pretending it's an accident, the protagonist dodges by luck, which is becoming frustrating. The archer advises Cal to stay calm, as their target is not a hunt far from Hyun Wu. The group discusses how much time they have left to set up the ambush. Crawford says they should keep acting, but it wouldn't be good if it took too long to finalize the plan. The archer, who is the leader of the cheaters, mentions that he was also planning to finish this quickly while they intended to kill the protagonist during the fight against the creatures, creating an excuse so it wouldn't be obvious. Tangy listens to everything, hiding behind a tree. The pet goes directly to tell Hyun Woo that their plan was to stab him in the back while facing the boss. The marionette bear waved his arms, saying that was exactly the group's plan. Now, the protagonist has proof that they are indeed PK players, so he begins to devise a plan. After leveling up significantly and thanks to them, his tasks had come to an end, he decides to attack the group first, with a devilish grin. The protagonist thinks of filming everything, and imagines a title like, I killed a bunch of PKs, look at what happened, as a catchy name for a video. Hyun Woo was determined to make the group pay hundreds of times more for trying to betray him. Tangy was scared, seeing the expression on his master's face as he planned what to do next. After some time, the group returns to where the protagonist was. Hen apologizes for the time he made Hyun Woo wait. The protagonist says it's no problem. The archer approaches and says they are going to hunt a boss, inviting the protagonist to join them. Hyun Woo tries not to reveal that he already knows everything, saying that he would only be a hindrance rather than a help. Hen, with an obsessive look, insists that he won't be a hindrance at all as the protagonist has great offensive power. The archer wanted to convince Hyun Woo by any means necessary, as he couldn't back down now. Hen starts to say that if it weren't for what the protagonist had done, they wouldn't have gotten this far, so they should hunt the boss together. Laughing, Hyun Woo says he'll have to agree after hearing all that, and asks Hen if they will maintain the same combat formation. The archer replies that they will. The rest of the group could no longer tolerate the protagonist, but were still trying to hold it together. As they set off for the boss, Hyun Woo begins to test the group's patience by saying he will show them what it really means to carry someone. Cal becomes increasingly agitated, thinking that soon he will kill that cocky little punk. Now at the location where the boss resides, the group had already defeated some elves that were with the elf chief. Before the big confrontation began, Cal and Crawford were fighting directly with the boss, who managed to kick Cal, sending him flying. The creature tells the warrior on the ground how they had already collapsed after just receiving that attack which wasn't even that powerful. The elf continues to say that they only came to the forest to test their strength, but being minimally strong is the proper etiquette of a warrior. However, it seemed they weren't ready. The boss of the forest was the dark elf chief. Cal thinks that even wearing low-level gear, it's difficult to face that boss, even at level 40. Meanwhile, Crawford, who was protecting his companion, could hardly wait for Hen to give the signal to attack the protagonist. The warrior remembers that the lead archer had said that Hyun Woo would likely train his skills even during the boss's attack. So, it would be at that moment that they would strike, and as soon as Basil applied the buff to the whole group, Hen would shoot a paralyzing arrow at the protagonist. Then, everyone in the group should focus their attacks on him. He also recalls that Cal wanted to know if the plan was to take out Hyun Woo with just one rush. Licking his sword, he says he wanted to have fun with the protagonist, that cocky little punk, while he was paralyzed. Everyone thought Cal was a complete psychopath, but that was the plan. Back in combat, Hyun Woo prepares to attack after his skill cooldown is over. Hen notices and gives the signal for Basil to start the plan. The priestess uses the buff on the group's warriors while the protagonist charges at the elf. Cal starts laughing, seeing that their plan is finally beginning, while the archer prepares to shoot the arrow at Hyun Woo. 
Tangy, discreetly, begins to climb up Hyunwoo's back until he is very close to his ear and blows softly at the exact moment Hen fires the arrow. Cal, who was already prepared to attack the protagonist and could hardly wait to enjoy torturing him, is the one who takes the arrow shot, which causes a critical hit. Immediately, Hen apologizes and says it was the cursed bear that distracted him. Cal looks at the archer, still confused, but can hardly speak as he is beginning to feel paralyzed. The protagonist, seeing the warrior on the ground while still pretending he didn't know their plan, expresses his sympathy and says that Tangy is just a silly idiot. Crawford completely loses his concentration, turning his back to the approaching elf chief without realizing it. Hen tries to warn him, but Tangy keeps pulling the archer's face, breaking his focus entirely. Meanwhile, Yunwu just observes the situation and still hasn't acted. The elf grabs the warrior by the neck and lifts him using only one hand, saying that letting one's guard down is a pleasure that doesn't belong to the weak. Crawford starts calling for the protagonist, who runs towards the elf, telling him to let him go. The creature looks at Hyunwoo to see what his move will be, but doesn't understand why the protagonist has thrust his sword into Crawford, who is his teammate. The warrior, who is on the verge of dying, asks Hyunwoo why he did that to him. The protagonist replies that this was the final move, a stab in the back. Hen and Basil are stunned and ask the protagonist what he's doing. Looking at the PK players, Hyunwoo, smiling, tells them what they wanted to hear, as they were the ones trying to betray someone so they should know that anything could happen to them. The elf chief looks at the protagonist, completely bewildered. The archer wants to know when they had planned to betray him. Tangy begins to imitate exactly how he had acted when gathering the group to plan the PK. The bear says, while glaring at the chief, kill him and act like it was a mistake, and we can simply say our movements went wrong. Hen is surprised and asks how the bear knew all that. The archer immediately readies his weapon and starts firing arrows at the protagonist in an attempt to kill him. But that is not enough to defeat him, as Hyunwoo easily slices through the arrows flying straight at him. The protagonist is now about to kill the priestess and the archer, who have no significant power in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Meanwhile, the elf chief, holding the tip of an arrow, just watches all the chaos unfold. The creature notices that Cal, the warrior, is crawling beside him, saying that if he could walk, Hyunwoo would be an easy target. The elf, with just one strike, decapitates Cal and states that the defeated should not speak. Meanwhile, the protagonist uses his sword to strike Basil and Hen. The elf chief, seeing what Hyunwoo is doing, thinks that fighting him seems much more interesting. With all the PK players down, Tangy holds a stick as if it were his sword, while the protagonist checks to see if everything was recorded properly. He also realizes that those players were only slightly higher level than him, but their skills were pathetic. Thus, it wouldn't be easy to attract attention if his opponents were so weak. Still, he is pleased as it was a situation good enough, and the video seemed quite entertaining. Now that the story was complete, the protagonist simply wanted to have an opponent with whom he could showcase his skills. The elf chief, who was sitting, asks if Hyunwoo is done and stands up with his magic sword, stating that facing someone powerful like him is always a pleasure. The protagonist gets excited for the battle and says that the subtitle for the video, Level 20 Player Facing a Dark Elf Boss, should be enough. Then, both charge at each other to begin the fight. Outside the game, Quan watches the video that Kong recorded while playing and asks how he managed to find people like that. Thrilled about the great day, the protagonist says he managed to gather items dropped by PKs and also the rewards from the boss attack, and those players dropped a good amount of items due to the penalties of committing murder. Quan says it seems the video will truly be amazing, now they just need to find a good editor and can get that show on the road. The protagonist asks his friend if he is talking about streaming. Quan leaves it a mystery and doesn't say what it could be. Kong, seeing his friend getting up, wants to know why he can't find out if it has to do with him. Quan, smiling, says he will know everything when the time comes. Meanwhile, a paper is printed stating the project to turn Kong Hyunwoo into a pop star, the return of the 1%. At another time, Quan begins looking for a decent video editor. Doing some research, he finds several, but none are up to par to make good edits for the videos. He then thinks of increasing the pay a bit to see if he can find better professionals, as Hyunwoo filmed well, and now all they needed was a talented editor. After a while of searching, Quan notices someone who could be their editor. The profile name was Ellis Films, and his specialty was editing arena videos and achievements. The most popular video of that month in the arena world also earned him the title of Content Creator of the Year in the Arena. This editor was somewhat expensive, but fit perfectly. Ellis, a video editor known for being a ghost among arena content creators, meticulously inspects every frame of the video and uses carefully chosen music, 
Their color palette attracts many viewers, and Ellis has received a nickname from the Arena content creator community, the Virtuoso Video Editor. That's what they call him. Ellis, at his home, is checking his inbox to see what his next job will be. There are several offers, but they aren't always good, as he chooses based on the best recorded video. Deleting several messages from people who he had just evaluated the videos as poor, he finds a message from Young Chan. He quickly remembers that this is the guy his friend Michael introduced him to. Ellis opens the video and is impressed with the content. While watching, he also recalls, this is the guy who uploads Melee God's videos. The editor finds the narrative of the hunt perfect and can even see the stars during the fight against the boss, which is something incredible. Ellis feels excited, wanting to edit that video. After watching it, he is determined to be a fan of Hyunwoo from that moment on, and also wants to bring him to the main stage of the arena. Meanwhile, in the game, the protagonist begins to feel chills and deduces that there might be hidden enemies nearby. Tangy, noticing that his master is acting strange, starts to worry about him, but nothing happens after that moment of fear. The protagonist begins to activate a book that the PKs dropped as a penalty. His pet is on his back, curious to know what it is. It's a rare random skill book with a rare rank, and the effect when used is that the player receives a random skill of rare rank. The protagonist intends to sell that item for a lot of money, but he could also get something good if he uses it. So, Hyunwoo asks Tangy if, hypothetically, he had an empty lot and didn't know what would happen but was considering building a farm there. Would it be better to sell it as it is or not? After listening, the bear tells the protagonist what they would do with the land if he sold it. Hyunwoo says he would probably build a farm. Tangy asks why he would sell such poor land then. After hearing his pet's advice, the protagonist still isn't satisfied because what he meant to say is that since he had already sold the items from the PKs, it wasn't necessary to sell that one. Hyunwoo makes his decision and quickly opens the book, deducing that he has nothing to lose, as it's not like he bought it with his own money. The message then appears, you used a rare random skill book. You learned a new skill, blood for blood, a passive spirit punch with unique rank and proficiency, F, that ignores 10% of the opponent's defense. The protagonist is pleased to see that this skill has 10% penetration in defense, so he starts spinning Tangy by the arm and celebrates using the book instead of selling it, claiming that his pet is a lucky charm. While spinning, the bear tells his idiot master to let him go. A few days later, Hyunwoo's video was uploaded to the arena world. The title of the video was Baiting the PKs. The response was overwhelming, especially among users who had been attacked by the PKs when they were around the same level. Quan celebrates, seeing that they've already surpassed 150,000 views. He is pleased to have chosen Ellis as the editor, as his videos are well edited. Quan notices that they are charging little to upload the videos, and realizes that users also like Hyunwoo. He also uploads the video to his channel. It was already night, and in a commercial building, Kale, the manager of the business team that is part of Nike's management, watches Hyunwoo's video, and is surprised by the video hunting PKs, noting it's a fun premise after the roles are reversed. After watching a good part of the video, where the protagonist manages to defeat the group of players, he notices that the video isn't finished and still has the part where Hyunwoo duels the elf chief, showcasing his great combat skills, dodging and counter-attacking without showing much effort in his movements, leaving the creature furious for not being able to defeat the human. The chief begins to use all his strength and speed, but still fails to hit the protagonist, who counters and cuts the arm of the elf chief. Kale is amazed that a user with such a low level is easily defeating an elf chief, controlling himself so well, and recognizes that he has been wasting his time with unsatisfactory candidates. He asserts that this player has what it takes to be a star, so he has to get him to sign with Nike. Seeing the channel name, which is Argon, he thinks about quickly contacting them. Back in the game, in the Black Forest North Zone, the protagonist is fighting a group of orcs who, even outnumbered, have no trouble defeating them. The group of monsters is furious after seeing the human kill one of their companions. Hyunwoo asks Tangy to use his buff. The pet immediately complies with his master's request and calls him a slowpoke while charging into the attack. The protagonist knows he is definitely leveling up faster than in the past, and since he had played the first time as Melee God, he lacked items and knowledge then, and this time it is much easier. But still, Hyunwoo recognizes that he is behind in the game and needs to improve that as quickly as possible. He then charges into battle against the group of orcs. After defeating the creatures, the protagonist opens his status window. Hyunwoo is at level 24 and is a warrior, already holding the title of warrior recognized by Khan, with a strength of 55 plus 68, agility of 50 plus 28, condition of 40 plus 50, and 30 in magic. 
The protagonist already thinks that the orcs in the meadow are a piece of cake after easily defeating that group. Tangy tells his master that he has also become stronger. The protagonist opens the pet's status window. Tangy is at level 15, the marionette bear holding the title Heir of Buzzing Island, with a friendship level of 15, strength and agility of 35, 50 in condition, and 90 in magic, along with the skills Bear Spirit and Forest Blessing. The protagonist is surprised to learn that his pet is already at level 15, because in all the pets he's seen so far, each level grants a status increase. Uncommon pets gain between 3 to 5 points, rare pets between 6 to 7, and unique pets between 8 to 10. Based on Tangi's status growth, the protagonist deduces that he is definitely a unique pet. Additionally, Hyunwoo recognizes that the buffs Tangi provides are very good, and in the future, he should be able to tank as well. But the protagonist still disliked some of his behaviors, like climbing onto his shoulders and calling him a dumb master. The pet wanted Hyunwoo to carry him, as he was tired after swatting the bear. Together, the protagonist and Hyunwoo search for items that the orcs might have. Hyunwoo wants to be thorough and leave nothing behind, while the protagonist was searching one of the orcs nearby. He notices something shiny on another creature near him. Curious, he immediately goes to check what it is. It was a necklace, but the protagonist didn't know how an item like that would drop there. He had never seen such an object before. A message appears. You have received a new mission, the heir of the Meadow Wolf Tribe. Hyunwoo doesn't know how that quest works, so he opens the mission window for the heir of the Meadow Wolf Tribe. You have discovered the Bone Necklace of Cancun, the future chief of the Meadow Wolf Tribe. Deliver the necklace to the current chief, Raycon. The quest was ranked D, but the goal was to deliver the Bone Necklace to Raycon, and the reward was experience. Details. For Chief Raycon to appear, you must first be acknowledged by the monster boss, champion of the Meadow Dakan. After reading the quest details, the protagonist realizes it's a delivery mission, and he may need to be recognized by a monster boss. Tangy, sitting on his shoulder, curious, also wanted to see the mission details so he could help. The champion Dakan will be very difficult to defeat, and Chief Raycon is probably an NPC. Hyunwoo now has a mission and needs to find an NPC he's never heard of before. But since it's a higher ranked mission, he needs to be at least level 30 so he has to wait four more levels to be ready. The protagonist quickly decides to start rushing, needing to hunt as much as he can, holding Tangy by the head. Hyunwoo runs off to find more creatures to duel and gain more experience. The pet yells at his master to stop and rest for a bit. After some time in the forest, the protagonist finds another group of orcs, and after defeating them, he realizes he's progressing too slowly. Tangy starts to get irritated seeing how his master is performing. Hyunwoo is frustrated that, after so much effort, he only leveled up once, realizing there's a limit to what he can do alone. Tangy gets angry and begins to scold the protagonist, asking what he means by alone, as he's been working hard to assist him from behind. But Hyunwoo wasn't paying attention to his pet and starts thinking that playing in a group might help him level up faster. But that would only be possible if he found people he could trust. The bear gets irritated that his master isn't giving him enough attention. After a while of standing still, the protagonist hears an explosion coming from not far away. It sounded like a bomb, but it could also be magic. A mage who was also in the forest was fighting an orc. The mage used the magic arrow skill, which causes an explosion after being fired. The creature could barely react to the young man's explosive magic, and after causing a distraction, he used the fireball spell to defeat the orc. The mage's name was Mason, and that was the tenth orc he had defeated that day. Sitting down to rest, he thought about how quickly his mana was depleting and that his potions were running out. Perhaps it was time to stop for the day. Mason recognized there was a limit to how much he could hunt alone. While the young man was reflecting alone, Hyunwoo approached from behind, and after hearing what the mage had said, the protagonist arrives, saying, You said alone. Mason, startled, turns around, ready for an attack, thinking it was a monster, but even though he hadn't rested properly, he wasn't going to give up easily. The mage stands up and uses his magic arrow. The protagonist, with his pet on his back, has no reaction. After casting his spell, the young man realizes it's a person and not a monster, seeing that the magic arrow just grazed Hyun Wu's shoulder and he starts apologizing. The protagonist, holding Tangy, who was crying in fear, scratching his head, says that was dangerous. Mason is impressed, thinking the protagonist managed to dodge his magic from such a short distance. Hyun Wu tells the young man to relax, since it was his fault for appearing out of nowhere, and then introduces himself, saying his name. The mage, feeling awkward, also introduces himself. Mason asks the protagonist if he needed anything while thinking about who this guy might be, dressed like a clown and carrying a suspicious teddy bear. 
Smiling, Hyunwoo reflects on how impressive the mage's magic power and casting speed are. Then he says that since it looks like Mason is alone, he asks if he'd like to hunt together. The protagonist even promises that he's strong. Mason, before answering, tries to recall if he had heard of any PK, player killer. With that strange appearance, as seeing how the protagonist dodged his attack, he wasn't just any player. Since it was hard to hunt alone, the mage thought it was a good opportunity, so he accepts the protagonist's offer, who was smiling kindly, waiting for his answer. With a handshake, they agree. Elsewhere in the Black Forest, orcs were being torn apart like paper by a knight named Sean. His partner tells him to have more fun while they're there, as it was the Guildmaster's order. The knight says, boring is boring. They were warriors from the Black Skull Guild. Gain asks Park, the other group member with them, how the trip was going and if he was feeling safe. Enthusiastic, the young warrior says yes, even though it was his first time catching a ride like that. Park was also a member of the infamous Black Skull Guild, and his ID had been deleted in an accident. But the higher-ups valued his contributions and asked him to create a new ID, since they were going to carry him back to his level. The reason he lost his previous account was due to a coward who invaded the guild's territory. In this case, the protagonist, who, to Park, unfairly won a bet that cost him his character's deletion. Now his goal was to find him and make him feel the wrath of his guild, all thanks to his seniors. As the Black Skull group walked, Gain mentions that there didn't seem to be many orcs that day, as it looked like another group was hunting nearby. Sean tells Park that their goal was to get him to level 25 that day, but at that pace, it didn't seem like they would make it. The big warrior thinks that to wipe out so many orcs like that, they needed more than just a group of two. Park notices an orc spawning behind them and tells his son Benyams, seniors, that he'll take care of it immediately. The young warrior runs to attack the orc. Elsewhere in the forest, Hyunwoo and Mason were defeating another group of orcs. The mage, smiling, tells the protagonist that it's good they're together because now it's going much faster than when he was alone. Hyunwoo agrees with his partner, noting that he had even leveled up already. They had even developed a strategy. First, the protagonist attracts the orcs and lures them to an area. Then, Mason uses his long-range magic attack on them, and afterward, the protagonist finishes off the monsters. All they did was repeat this process, but now they were leveling up much faster. While taking a break before the next fight, Tangy tells Mason that since his spells are great, he would allow him to become his servant. The mage, with a good sense of humor, laughs. But the protagonist doesn't miss the opportunity and asks his pet if he's sure about that, as Mason's first greeting was a magic arrow. Tangy is shocked and says he had forgotten about that indiscriminate weapon of terror. The mage, seeing the two talking like that, becomes embarrassed and says it was both their fault and that he just gets scared easily and doesn't attack people. Tangy notices another orc appearing and warns his master that there's another monster. Hyunwoo tells Mason to save his mana as he will take care of the orc alone. The young man agrees with his partner and just watches from behind. The protagonist waits for the right moment and then charges at the monster that had just appeared. After striking the orc, he notices someone else coming toward the same monster. Park, who was already nearby, immediately recognizes the protagonist and shouts, It's you, that bastard from last time. He also says he's been looking for him since that day. Without saying a word, Hyunwoo kicks Park in the face, who wasn't expecting such a reaction. The protagonist, looking at the warrior on the ground, apologizes and says he thought he was a monster. Immediately, Gain and Sean pull Park, who was stunned after the blow. Mason doesn't like what Hyunwoo did, but Hyunwoo explains that it wasn't his fault. He was just startled. Park starts regaining consciousness and says the protagonist hit him on purpose. He tells his son Benims, seniors, that this is the guy who defeated him on his previous account. Even with a broken nose, the Black Skull Guild warrior says he's glad to have found Hyunwoo after his ID was deleted. After Park says that, the protagonist recognizes him and asks for his name, as he doesn't remember. Park starts shouting his name while holding his broken nose. Mason asks Hyunwoo if he knows this person. The protagonist responds that it's just an idiot friend who lost his character in a bet. Park goes crazy hearing that and shouts, asking who is friends with whom and says that now there are two guild executives with him, meaning the protagonist is as good as dead. Gain, smiling, places his hand on his companion's shoulder and tells him to calm down, then starts telling Hyunwoo that he should moderate his tone because his patience has limits. Scratching his ear, the protagonist begins mocking the Black Skull Guild warrior. Mason is astonished watching this, while Tangy holds onto his master's leg. Hyunwoo asks Gain what he's going to do when his patience runs out, saying he's not afraid of the Rotten Bone Guild or whatever it's called. The warrior is taken aback, correcting him, saying it's Black Skull. 
The mage tells the protagonist that those two warriors seem to be at least level 60, so they could hurt him. Hyunwoo tells Mason not to get involved if he ends up fighting them. Sean and Gain turn around and start walking, finding the whole situation annoying since they were busy hunting. Park, not understanding why his son Bainams are doing that, says he has no choice but to report them. The warriors stop walking and start looking at him, waiting for him to say more. Park, with an obsessive look and a bleeding nose, says he'll tell the bosses that they ran away after hearing someone badmouthing the guild. Sean looks at him and asks him to follow his lead and that he'll apologize later. The big warrior takes a deep breath and strikes Park in the face with his sword, saying how arrogant it was of him to say such a thing. After the loudmouth passes out, Sean says it will be faster to hunt if one group disappears. The protagonist gets excited by this challenge and says he'll only accept if they bet on character deletion. Mason is horrified and tells Hyunwoo that his character will be deleted if he loses. Tangy is also worried, not knowing what will happen to him if his master loses. Smiling, the protagonist says he'll probably be deleted too. The bear is terrified upon hearing that. Sean, with his sword on his back, says he accepts and that the three of them can go, with the terms being character deletion, winner takes all, captain's battle style. The big warrior also says it's very arrogant of the protagonist, as he's only level 20. Captain's battles consist of one captain from each side dueling. The winner continues, and then the next representative from the losing team enters the fight. The side that runs out of representatives first is considered the loser. The first duel will be between player Hyunwoo and player Sean. Already recovered, Park says he's going to shut the protagonist's mouth this time. Mason, worried about Hyunwoo, asks if he's really going to be okay. The protagonist responds that there's no need to worry, that it'll be easy. Tangy on the mage's back was desperately shouting that he would curse his master if he lost. Then the message appears. The duel is about to begin. Sean says he'll finish this with just one blow, as he has other things to do. Meanwhile, the protagonist says it'll take more than one hit due to the level difference. He plans to end the duel with ten strikes. Sean, rushing to attack, says he now understands why Park hates him so much. The large warrior is about to land a blow on the protagonist, who observes the movement of his opponent's sword and dodges at the right moment, counterattacking. Sean is impressed by the speed and, while noticing a wound on his neck, the protagonist says, that was the first strike. The Black Skull Guild warriors are amazed, seeing what just happened. Mason is stunned by what Hyunwoo did, reading the sword's trajectory and counterattacking while dodging. Sean starts attacking the protagonist wildly, but he evades easily. The big warrior can't understand why he can't land any hits, and while raising his sword, he claims he'll win the duel by relying on his gear. But before he can attack, he receives another counterattack, and still doesn't understand how there could be such a gap between them, yet he's losing the duel. Dodging another blow, the protagonist taunts Sean, saying if he's surprised, it's because everyone thinks they can win just by being high level, but they're playing in the arena. Kicking Sean's helmet, sending him flying, the protagonist says gear levels don't matter here, as they don't guarantee victory in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and even if someone is lower level, there's always a way to hurt the opponent. Then, the protagonist lands the third strike, slashing the neck of the big warrior who's now on his knees. Hyunwoo explains that by making the opponent bleed from multiple wounds, anyone can be defeated, regardless of level, using that method. Mason is impressed by Hyunwoo, because even though they hadn't been together long, he had already noticed how good Hyunwoo's combat control was, but didn't realize he was at this level. As for Gain and Park, they were paralyzed, seeing what had happened to Sean, who was the best warrior among them. The message appears. First duel, player Hyunwoo wins. The protagonist calls for the next challenger. Gain, shocked and afraid of losing as well, prepares for the fight, but this battle was completely one-sided. Intimidated by Hyunwoo's skills, Gain was defeated without landing a single blow, leaving only one participant. Seeing Park's condition, the protagonist says it's a shame they have to fight again especially now that the Black Skull Warrior was being carried just to rebuild his character, and he's about to be deleted again. Park trembles in fear in front of Hyunwoo, who asks if any guild members will still want to carry him. The protagonist remembers Hanbek when he looks at Park, maybe because both were arrogant due to the support they had, and also because they looked a bit alike. This made Park even more annoying to the protagonist. Then he tells Park to kneel and beg, maybe he'd spare him. The loudmouth was paralyzed and didn't know what to do, because when he was at level 40, he had taken a fatal blow, and now, at only level 20, there was no way he could escape. He was suffering from extreme anxiety, his heart rate accelerating, and the arena recognized his irregular state, rewarding him by putting Player Park into berserk mode. Mason and Tangy were terrified, 
Seeing that the protagonist's opponent had gained even more strength, now, as Park charged to attack, Hyunwoo drives his sword into the ground and says that the first time they met, he already knew Park was the type of guy who gets easily enraged. The protagonist activates the giant's strength ability, boosting his strength for a short period, and preparing to deliver a powerful punch, says it's time. He tells Park that it's time for him to go, and with a strong punch to the loudmouth's face as he charges like a beast, he slams him into the ground with such force that it cracks the earth. Then, the message appears. Victory. You have won the duel, receiving rewards based on the winner-takes-all rule, gaining three chests containing the player's items. Hyunwoo opens his inventory to check what he's won, seeing that he's practically gained all their items, and remarks that it was better than hunting monsters. Ecstatic, Mason approaches, calling out to the protagonist, and says he was fighting impressively, defeating someone of a higher level with just his technique. Hyunwoo tells his partner that he had already mentioned it was nothing. The mage, still amazed, tells the protagonist that he's going to be his fan. Hyunwoo just laughs, thinking how surprised Mason would be if he told him that he used to be the top-ranked player, but that would be a bit embarrassing to admit at the moment. The mage was already looking at the protagonist with admiration when he invites Mason to hunt again. Super excited, Mason doesn't hesitate to agree with Hyunwoo. After hunting for a while longer, the young mage tells the protagonist that, thanks to him, leveling up had become much easier, and he asks if they can do it again sometime, then sends a friend request. Smiling, Hyunwoo accepts the request and says they'll hunt together again soon. Tangi gets excited, knowing he'll see Mason again. The protagonist acknowledges that, with the young mage's help, he was able to reach level 31. Now his stats were as follows. Strength of 64, with an additional 68, agility of 68, with an extra 28 conditionally raising it to 49, plus a bonus of 50, and magic at 39. Hyunwoo, saying goodbye to Mason who was already leaving, recognizes that there aren't many innocent people like him in the arena, and feels they will get along well in the future, because he is also skilled. Tangi was babbling on, telling his masters they should rest because he was tired, but the protagonist wasn't paying much attention to his pet, since now that he had leveled up enough, he wanted to finish the mission he had received. After picking up the necklace, the marionette bear was stunned, seeing that his master wasn't listening to him. The mission's objective is to deliver the heir of the Meadow Wolf tribe necklace. You discovered Cancun's bone necklace, the future chief of the Meadow Wolf tribe. Deliver the necklace to the current chief, Rakan. It was a difficulty D quest. Objective, deliver the bone necklace to Rakan. Reward, experience. The mission details indicated that for Chief Rakan to appear, you must first be acknowledged by the boss, the Meadow Champion Dakan. Now the protagonist knows that to find the chief, he first needs to find the boss who spawns in the meadow of the Meadow Wolf Tribe, Dakan. This type of boss normally spawns randomly in the area where the player is, with a respawn time of 12 hours, and it had been more than 12 hours since the protagonist arrived, so the boss should already be around. Hyunwoo was frustrated, not knowing why Dakan hadn't appeared yet. Meanwhile, Tangi was exhausted from walking so much. The pet tells the protagonist they should rest for a bit because he can't walk anymore due to being so tired. Hyunwoo says that they'll stop for a bit now since he's also tired. Tangi points to a door at the root of a tree and says that place looks like a good spot to rest. The protagonist, seeing the door, tries to remember where he had seen a place like that before. As he approaches the door, the message appears, enter the dwelling of the champion Dakan. Hyun Wu gets excited, as he had been wanting to finish the mission for some time, while Tangi is frozen, realizing they won't be resting yet. The protagonist, lifting his pet, starts celebrating, saying he's a lucky charm and knew he could find the dungeon entrance. The marionette bear cries, saying he just wanted to rest. The protagonist tells him to stop crying, or he'll unsummon him. After Hyunwoo casts a spell to let his pet rest, he wonders how the boss would appear since it doesn't spawn in the field like other monsters. But now that he's found it, he no longer has doubts. He knocks on the door to see what's inside. The door opens and a large orc appears. Awkwardly, Hyunwoo greets the creature but notices the orc's massive body and the overwhelming pressure emanating from him. This was Dokken, who asked the protagonist what business a human had there. Hyunwoo realizes he wouldn't be able to defeat him at his current level. After the orc repeats his question, the protagonist shows him the necklace and says he's there to deliver it to Rakan. Upon seeing the item, Dakan remarks that it's Cancun's necklace, and wonders if his ally has caused trouble again. Grabbing the necklace from the protagonist's hands, the orc thanks him and tells him he can leave now. But Hyunwoo pulls the necklace back before Dakan can close his hand, leaving the monster confused about what the human wanted. This repeated several times, 
Dakan bends down and asks the protagonist if he didn't hear him say to deliver it and leave. Smiling, Hyunwoo insists on delivering the necklace to Rakan personally. The protagonist figured the mission wouldn't end if he handed over the necklace now, so he was determined to get more out of the quest. Dakan says he recognizes that spirit in the protagonist, but if he wants to meet the chief, he needs a certain level of power so he'll test him. The message appears, you have received a new mission, Dakan's recognition. You need Dakan's recognition to meet Rakan, fight him to gain his approval. It was rated as D-plus difficulty. The goal was Dakan's recognition, with the reward being Dakan's favor and Dakan's necklace. Hyunwoo is excited to know he wasn't wrong and has another mission, realizing that the necklace is at least rare. The orc announces the trial will begin, placing his hand on the protagonist's head and tossing him into the air. Hyunwoo tries to land in a combat-ready stance as Dakan is already preparing to strike with his sword. The orc strikes where the protagonist was, but hits the ground instead, as Hyunwoo dodges incredibly, leaving Dakan surprised. After realizing his attack missed, the orc notices the protagonist right in front of him, ready to counterattack. He wonders how the human managed to dodge his attack and then strike back, but using his sword as support, Dakan dodges and counterattacks with a kick, hitting the protagonist squarely. Hyunwoo acknowledges that at level 31, he's still extremely weak, and the orc is too strong for him to defeat using just skill control. Hyunwoo looks at Dakan and states that he's definitely the strongest opponent he's faced since returning to the arena. The orc, retrieving his sword from the ground, says that alone isn't enough for the human to meet the chief, and questions the protagonist, suggesting that surely he has more power than that. Hyunwoo, who was on the ground, getting up after the kick, has 120 GP left out of a total of 520. Not giving up, the protagonist tells Dokken he hasn't used all his power yet. He then summons Tangy, who was peacefully drinking his tea. The pet asks Hyunwoo if he realizes how long it's been since he said he wanted to rest. The protagonist, in a critical moment, tells Tangy it's an emergency and asks him to prepare his buff. Furious, the marionette bear charges at his master, telling him to stop hunting so much as he's become addicted. Irritated, the protagonist tells Tangy he's a pet, so he should act like one. Dakan, watching the bear argue with the human, asks Tangy if he's the troublemaker from Buzz Island. Immediately they stop, and the pet recognizes the orc's voice, calling him uncle and bursting into laughter. Dakan says it's been a long time since they've seen each other and asks if this human is his new master. Tangy confirms and says he can call that human his stupid master. The protagonist is surprised to learn they knew each other. The marionette bear asks Hyunwoo if they were fighting by any chance. The protagonist replies that no, he just had to pass a test in order to meet the orc Rakan. Since Tangy also knows the orc chief, he decides to help his master by stomping on the ground. Dekan says that's enough talk, as the protagonist is still in the middle of a trial, and since the human is Tangy's master, they can fight together. With his arms crossed, the pet says he doesn't think it's smart to interfere, so he'll just cast spells from where he is. Hyunwoo, focused on winning the battle, tells the marionette bear that casting spells is all he knows how to do anyway. After receiving the bear spirit's buff, the protagonist's constitution and strength increase, and with the forest blessing buff, his defense rises, and his HP begins to regenerate continuously. Dakan, ready for battle, tells the protagonist that he won't go easy on him just because he's a friend of his. Hyunwoo admits that even with the buffs, he still doesn't think he can win, but he won't stop, and is determined to go as far as he can. Then he charges into battle against the orc. After some time fighting, the protagonist is on the ground, confirming what he already expected, that even giving his all, he couldn't defeat Dakan. The orc asks the protagonist if that was all he had. Still on the ground, Hyunwoo says he gives up, sitting and trying to stand up slowly. Tangy tells his master to stop overdoing it. The protagonist replies that he would die if he kept fighting, which is why he surrendered. His pet says that he still fought well against Dakan, but to Hyunwoo, none of it matters, as it would be in vain if he didn't pass the trial. The orc approaches them and tells the protagonist that he had said he needed to defeat him. Hyunwoo is surprised by Dakan's words. Then, the message appears. You completed Dakan's recognition, receiving his favor. The orc tells the protagonist that he has proven he is capable. A necklace appears around Hyunwoo's neck, the reward for passing the test. The message appears, you received Dakan's necklace. The protagonist, along with Tangy, celebrates the achievement until another message pops up. Rakan is about to appear. Hyunwoo freezes after seeing the message, then a large explosion occurs behind him. Dakan, holding Tangy, waits for his chief to approach through the smoke. The chief of the Meadow Wolf tribe, Rakan, is there. 
Seeing the orc chief now, Hyunwoo understands why he had to take that test. Compared to Rakan, Dakan was like mild coffee, and Rakan an espresso, the best kind, even pure coffee beans. Dakan tells the orc chief that the man is here to deliver Cancun's necklace. Rakan is surprised to hear why Cancun's necklace is in the hands of the protagonist. Rakan shouts, asking if it was Hyunwoo who brought the necklace. Hyunwoo firmly replies that it was and hands it to the chief, who, after taking the necklace, recognizes that it belonged to one of his disciples. Furious, the large orc shouts, Cancun, you idiot, throwing the protagonist far away. The chief demands that Cancun be brought to him immediately. Hyunwoo, trembling with fear, realizes that Rakan's roar caused all his abilities to drop by 50%, and his HP was now impossible to restore. Dakan approaches the chief, asking him to calm down. Rakan tells his guard not to interrupt him. Breathing heavily, Rakan begins to think about what made Cancun hide his necklace this time. The mission story reveals that Cancun is Rakan's son and the future chief of the tribe. He hated his father's harsh training and ran away because of it. To prevent this, he was forced to wear a necklace that would reveal his location and summon him immediately. It was enchanted so it couldn't be removed, but someone helped him break the spell, allowing him to finally escape, and the one who broke the spell was Tangy. Embarrassed, the marionette bear admits that he didn't know things would get so out of control. The protagonist is impressed that his pet could do something like that. Tangy calls him an idiot master and says he has no idea how capable he really is. Hyunwoo finds his pet even more amazing. Rakan apologizes and tells the protagonist that it's a problem related to his son, so he lost his temper for a moment, but he would reward him for bringing the necklace. The following messages appear. You completed the mission Heir of the Plains Wolf Tribe, gaining experience. You leveled up, restoring stamina and magic, and learned a new skill, magic condensation. Magic is condensed to release greater power. It's a passive skill, of unique level, with F proficiency, increasing mana by 20%. Hyunwoo is thrilled with this unique skill, especially since magical abilities are the most coveted in the arena. Rakan tells the protagonist that if he ever runs into his son, to tell him that his home is the Black Forest, and Hyunwoo receives a new mission. The message from Rakan. The chief has a message for his son Cancun. If you find him, deliver the message. The mission had a C plus level, with the objective to deliver Rakan's message to Cancun, and the reward was experience and a gift from Rakan. The protagonist is surprised to receive another mission and starts to think the orc chief is generous, taking Rakan's hand and saying he would take care of it. Rakan tells the little bear from Buzz Island not to worry too much about Cancun. Tangy responds that he won't do that. The chief clarifies that there was no spell on the necklace, so it wasn't Tangy's fault. The pet becomes furious, realizing he can't break spells. Meanwhile, outside the game, Quan starts waking Kang, who is asleep on the couch dreaming about playing the arena. He tells his friend he has a mission for him. Quan says he has something important to tell him, so he needs to wake up quickly. In front of the computer, the young man tells the protagonist he has two pieces of good news, leaving Hyunwoo impressed as he sees a video with almost 130,000 views. Young Chan tells him the first piece of news, the video went viral. The protagonist celebrates, jokingly strangling his friend, saying it's all thanks to him, but Quan warns him not to celebrate just yet as the second piece of news is even better. After opening his message box, the young man reveals that he received an email from Nike management. The protagonist doesn't understand why Nike would contact them, so Young Chan explains that Nike, a fashion company, started investing in arena streams and is currently the number one company for arena management. Quan then tells Kong that they want to recruit him. The protagonist freezes upon hearing that the world's number one company wants to hire him, especially since it hasn't even been a week since he returned to the arena, and such an opportunity has already appeared. A series of images flash through the protagonist's mind, recalling his sick father in the hospital with his mother, the moments he spent working at the convenience store, and the humiliation he endured from Hanbeek at the mall, feeling devastated after punching the delinquent. Quan notices his friend trembling as he thinks, and asks if he has made up his mind. The protagonist simply replies that he has. Young Chan says that Nike has already sent over the contract and asks if Kang wants to make a call. The protagonist agrees. Sometime later, at the Nike management building, Kale, the team business manager for Nike, arrives at his boss's office and tells him that they've just signed the player from the video, and his name is Kang. He's decided to use the username Alibos, but since it's hard to pronounce, Kale refers to him as Mr. G. However, he mentions having trouble figuring out how to abbreviate the nickname he gave. The Nike management representative, Jamie, jokes that Kale is overcomplicating things and says to simply abbreviate it to MG. Smiling, 
The manager says the abbreviation reminds him of another player. The boss immediately recalls the other player, Melee God, who was number one in the rankings and disappeared two years ago. Jamie, remembering all the fame that player had, asks Kale why they didn't sign someone like that back then. The manager explains that, in the past two years, the number of arena players has exploded, making the game popular worldwide and generating unimaginable profits, turning it into a world of its own. After hearing all that, Jamie asks Kale how he managed to sign the legendary player who returned to the game before anyone else. But regardless, he begins to wonder just how much the return of this top-ranked player will shake up the arena world. Meanwhile, Quan and Kang were celebrating the new contract, drinking beer. Inside the arena, at the auction house integrated into Aslan, the protagonist has his inventory open, selecting some items to sell after clearing out the loot he received from the PK group and the Black Skull Guild. He ended up getting 5,100 gold and a pair of boots. The item was the Swamp Frog boots, made from the leather of a swamp frog, which might make the wearer jump higher when worn. They had a rare class with a minimum requirement of 80 agility, a durability of 200, a defense of 41, an additional 15 points in agility, and an increased jump ability. Hyunwoo, holding the necklace, remembers that he received an item from the Dakan mission. It was the plane symbol, given to humans who demonstrate great combat skills and is filled with fighting spirit. It had a unique class and required Dakan's recognition. The effect was an increase of 100 strength, 50 conditioning, and 50 fighting spirit. The fighting spirit is created. All abilities increase during battle, significantly when dueling a strong opponent, and when fighting a weaker opponent, the opponent's abilities decrease. Unused skill points do not count. The protagonist realizes that the Dokken necklace and its effects are no joke, and also knows that if he combines all the items he has received so far, two of his abilities will be around level 60, as he has two unique items, the plane symbol and the ring containing the spirit of a giant, and three rare items, the fur coat with a minor wind spirit, the red mole fur pants, and finally, the swamp frog boots. And since he was at level 32, the protagonist thinks it would be great if he could buy a unique class weapon with the money he had left. He then opens the auction window, and the most important thing for him when deciding to buy a weapon is its attack power, as penetration defense doesn't matter much right now. Looking at some weapons available, he realizes that it won't be easy to get a unique class item with just 5,000 gold. But continuing his search, he finds the dwarf sword, a sword made with a dwarf's golden hammer. It has no magical processing, but it's still a valuable item. It had a unique class and requirements of 200 strength and 150 conditioning, a durability of 1,500, and an attack power of 700, with the effect that it doesn't break easily. This item was priced at just 1,000 gold, 10 times cheaper than it should be. Hyunwoo deduces that the sword was probably listed by someone leaving the game, but regardless, he needed to buy the item right then. Somewhere in the auction house, the Black Skull Guild Master, Sueron, starts trembling. A player beside him asks if there's a problem. Sueron says that his item was sold. The player, not understanding, asks if that's not a good thing. Furious, the leader shouts that he missed a zero and it was bought immediately. Sueron tells his subordinate to find the buyer and bring them to him immediately. The player, still confused, listens to her master and agrees to do so. Hyunwoo was nearby, but hadn't noticed all the commotion that the Black Skull Guild Master was causing. In fact, the protagonist was grateful for having gotten that item. This ensured that the feud between the Black Skull and Hunwoo was far from over. After leaving the auction house, the protagonist remembers that he has three days to sign the contract with Nike, so he needed to get stronger by then, even if just a little. He decides that completing missions is the best option to achieve that. Hyunwoo remembers that he still has Khan's mission, where he is supposed to meet LeBron. The quest was, find the Knight of Kioni. You received a recommendation from the class administrator, Khan. If you have confidence in your strength, find the Knight of Kyone, LeBron. The mission was level-based and had the goal of finding the Knight of Kyone. The reward was LeBron's skill. The protagonist had already gotten great rewards from the Plains Wolf Tribe mission, so he wondered what he could obtain from the strongest knight in the Empire. Hyunwoo starts stretching and remembers that Khan had said LeBron would be at his estate in Yuzma. So first, he wanted to know how much a teleport scroll to get there would cost. Once in the Yusma Empire, the protagonist is impressed, seeing the mansion where the knight lived. It was on a completely different level than he had imagined, but he admitted that it was to be expected from the strongest knight in the empire. Many players were passing by the entrance gate as Hyunwoo approached to talk to the mansion guards. 
The protagonist was excited to meet Lebron, as he had never seen him when he was still melee god. Upon reaching the entrance, the guards blocked his path, saying that civilians couldn't pass and that he had to turn back. Hyunwoo shows the coin to one of the guards and says that he has Khan's recommendation and was told he could see Lebron. The guards recognize that the protagonist is no ordinary civilian and let him through. The players, seeing that he had managed to enter the mansion, were astonished as they hadn't expected much from his appearance. Other players, realizing the gates were opening, knew the protagonist was heading toward the game's main storyline, something almost impossible to achieve. They considered following him, but the guards stopped several players who tried to follow Hyunwoo, some even yelling for the protagonist to form a group. As he walked to meet Lebron, Hyunwoo noticed that there were leeches everywhere, observing the reactions of the players, but he ignored that and thought about starting to record, as he had never seen a video of the strongest knight in the empire before. He could be the first to create such content. Now prepared, the protagonist walks toward the center of the estate, where the guards had said Lebron would be, but soon he notices a person meditating and starts thinking that it could be the knight. As he approaches, the man asks the protagonist if he was there with Khan's recommendation. Slightly embarrassed, Hyunwoo answers yes and introduces himself to the knight. Lebron says that it has been a long time since an adventurer had sought him out, and if Khan recommended him, that meant he was skilled. Immediately, the protagonist starts thinking that since it had been a long time since anyone had come there, it meant he wasn't the first, as until then, he thought he was the only one to get the coin. Lebron asks Hyunwoo if he was there to test his strength. Then he says that a sword fight reveals more about someone than a thousand words. Before answering, the protagonist thinks that he is actually there to complete the mission. Seeing that the young man wasn't answering, the knight grabs a wooden sword and asks Hyunwoo if he accepts the duel. After the protagonist signals yes, Lebron tosses the sword to him and says that he always promises challengers that he will teach them a skill after the duel. Confident, Hyunwoo says that if he manages to impress him, he could learn too. The knight responds that it could even be three if he wanted, but first he had to impress him. After Lebron gets ready for the fight, the messages for the protagonist appear. All abilities have been increased by the fighting spirit. The opponent is stronger than the player, and abilities will receive an additional boost. Confident, Hyunwoo thinks that now he'll get a unique skill. He then tells the knight to teach him well. Lebron tells the protagonist that he has a peculiar stance and that he had never seen anyone skilled with such a careless posture. But the knight, who had a lot of experience, pays close attention to the protagonist and notices that he is ready to fight, and the sloppiness in his stance disappears. Hyunwoo doesn't wait long and goes on the attack, which is soon blocked by Lebron, who recognizes, after defending several more of the protagonist's strikes, that his attacks were full of power, showing that he had spent a lot of time training a unique technique. The knight admits that Hyunwoo is not someone he could defeat just by having a good posture, as he even used his feet, showing that most knights wouldn't be able to defeat him. While dueling, Lebron evaluated the protagonist's every move until landing a strike, assessing that the young man had earned 50 points so far. Lebron realized that Hyunwoo wasn't very different from other challengers, as there had been approximately 10 opponents who had challenged him, none of whom scored more than 50 points. The knight, while thinking, waited for the protagonist's reaction, who was kneeling after receiving the blow. Seeing Hyunwoo, Lebron began to wonder if this young man was like all the others. Still on his knees, the protagonist admits that he can't win in any way, so he decides to give his all in the duel. He activates the crushing blow skill, where he runs and strikes with his weapon. Lebron, using his great technique, easily defends but acknowledges that he hadn't expected Hyunwoo to use a running skill at such a short distance. The knight notices that the young man was still in the air, ready to attack again, showing that he had calculated the distance he would cover after delivering the blow. The protagonist, thinking he had caught Lebron, says that now he had him and falls to the ground striking. Hyunwoo is astonished to hear the knight say that he had the guts to attempt a dangerous attack, even knowing the difference in their abilities, and had enough balance to prepare an attack mid-air. Lebron had stopped the protagonist's sword using only one finger, but tells Hyunwoo that he had interesting talent and had now earned 80 points. The protagonist is surprised by his score and already thinks about how many skills he'll earn, but Lebron, laughing, says it's now his turn to attack. Hyunwoo is paralyzed upon hearing this. The knight, laughing heartily, tells the protagonist to get into position. Lebron was pleased to have unexpectedly found someone talented. After a few more minutes of dueling, the protagonist is left with a large bump on his head and a sour expression, but now the test was over. Lebron approaches the young man and, with a handshake, says that he did great and recognizes his skill. 
Hyunwoo thanks him for the recognition but admits that, as the knight kept striking the same spot repeatedly, he wasn't someone the protagonist could defeat at such a low level. LeBron says that he gave a gold coin to every swordmaster, and now they had all returned. There had been nine other challengers, and Hyunwoo had been the tenth, and among them, he had been the strongest. The knight says that the protagonist was better than the other nine challengers combined. Messages appear. You have completed the mission, meet the knight of Kioni. You have received experience. You have leveled up, stamina and magic restored. Finally, you have received the title, recognized by LeBron. It is a title given to adventurers who receive recognition from the strongest knight of the Yusma Empire, LeBron, and has the effect of increasing all skills by 10%. The protagonist is happy to know that he earned a title with an incredible effect, and, as promised, smiling, LeBron hands him a book of skills. The knight apologizes for it being just a book, but the rules are predefined so he couldn't change them. Hyunwoo opens the book and gains the skill Combat Master, a skill given to a master of combat. You won't be defeated so easily in battle. It was a passive skill, of unique class and proficiency level F, and increases all skills by 10% in battle. The protagonist is amazed, seeing the effect this new skill gave him, as combined with the title he had just earned, it totaled 20%. LeBron says that he has kept his promise of the gold coin and tells the protagonist that he should return, but Hyunwoo asks the knight to wait. The protagonist was thinking that just that wasn't enough. He didn't believe the mission would end so suddenly, so he asks LeBron as he turned to leave if there was something more he could do to help him. The knight says he needs someone he can trust and he could rely on the protagonist. LeBron explains that a group of undead had appeared in Southern Briggs, and His Majesty believes that dark wizards are behind it. The knight wants Hyunwoo to investigate this for him. Then, a message appears. You have received a new mission, Briggs Investigation. There are rumors that undead have invaded the Southern Metropolis. Find out the truth behind the rumors for LeBron. The quest was of the TP class type, and its objective was to defeat the dark wizards with a reward of imperial contribution. The protagonist is surprised after reading the mission details, even more so when he realizes it's a main storyline quest. These are key missions involving the arena's story and affecting the entire game. Rumors say that the Dark Wizards specialize in necromancy and psychic magic. LeBron warns Hyunwoo to be careful not to be deceived. The protagonist says he understands and will be cautious when investigating Briggs thoroughly. After receiving the mission, Hyunwoo celebrates knowing that after leading the first episode, he was now helping with the fourth, and despite only being level 33, he had essentially become the protagonist of the main storyline. He then decides to prepare before leaving LeBron's mansion. Meanwhile, at the auction house integrated with Aslan, players were shocked to see how Sueron treated his subordinate, who still hadn't found the person who had bought her master's item. Sueron was grabbing the player by the neck, shaking her, and telling her to find the person as quickly as possible because he was tired of giving her items to hunt. The woman couldn't understand why her master was doing this to her when it was his mistake. The surrounding players just watched in silence, including the protagonist who had just arrived. The player, already uncomfortable with the situation, apologizes to Sueron and says she will find out by the next day who had bought the sword. Hyunwoo, having just arrived, still didn't know why there was such a commotion in the hall until he heard Sueron telling the woman to find the damned person who bought the dwarf's sword and make the player kneel before him. The protagonist is surprised upon hearing that, as it was the item he had bought before departing for the mission, but he didn't understand why this strange player was looking for him. After getting closer and seeing the mark on their armor, he realizes they are from the Black Skull Guild, so he recognizes that he was once again close to more trouble. He remembered the saying that grudges never fade, but Hyunwoo decides to log out of the game and leave the mess for another time. Outside the arena, Kang removes his mask and begins to think about how, even though the main storyline was waiting for him, he should deal with trivial matters like the item confusion as quickly as possible. The protagonist wonders if he should hunt down those guild players one by one in character deletion bets, but soon decides against it, thinking it would take too long, and for him, time was money. He contemplates defeating each of the players, making them crumble while having doubts about what to do. Quan opens the door and calls him to eat. While they were eating, the protagonist asks his friend what he should do. Young Chan asks what the problem was. After Hyunwoo explains what was happening, Quan says it's simple. Just publish a video taunting them or post a declaration of war on the community board, challenging the players to a PK battle. While they continue eating, the protagonist asks if he should do it directly. Quan replies that if he does it publicly in the community, the guild won't be able to ignore it. 
it would be a great opportunity to take on the black skulls all at once, and people would start talking about him, killing two birds with one stone. Chewing, Hyunwoo tells his friend that he's a genius. Wiping his mouth, Young Chan smiles and says it will only work if the protagonist can handle the players on his own. Smiling, Hyunwoo says he'll have them for breakfast. Thus, a declaration of war was created and posted on the community board the next day. Meanwhile, at the Black Skull House, the player arrived, telling her master there was an emergency. Sueron asks her why all the drama. The woman tells him to check the arena's community board, where someone had posted a video declaring war against them. The guild master is surprised to hear this and then opens the video, where a player named Ali Boss, who claimed to be an arena user, was speaking. The reason he recorded the video was because he had received an email from a low-level player thanking him for the video he made, which had helped the player win a character deletion bet against a Black Skull executive. Sueron, who was outside the game, was irritated, wondering who that guy was. Continuing the video, Ali Boss said he had decided to do whatever it took to make the other executives delete their accounts or push them into a similar state because the Black Skull Guild had monopolized hunting spots and terrorized other players for too long. Drawing his sword, the protagonist continues by saying that, to his knowledge, there were only 15 executives in the guild, including the master, but since he had already defeated two of them, only 13 remained. Ali Boss challenges each of them to a character deletion bet. Pointing his sword in an attack stance, he says he's going all in, with no regrets. Several players began commenting on the video, some even mentioning that they had also suffered attacks from the guild. After watching the video, Sueron is furious, realizing that the protagonist had the sword he mistakenly sold. With a devilish look, he now knows who the guy is that made the executives delete their accounts. It's the same one who took his dwarf sword. After logging back into the game, his subordinate asks him if he had seen the video and if they should ignore it, as getting involved might make things spiral further out of control. Sueron, enraged, tells the woman to summon the other executives. The player is shocked by this request, but in a fit of rage, he says they will crush that guy into dust and that the war was just beginning. At the Black Skull Guildhouse, all the members were gathered around a table. The Guildmaster's subordinate says that, based on what they know, Ali Boss is roughly level 30. However, knowing he managed to defeat two executives on his own, she believes he might be hiding something, and the character deletion bet he proposes is too risky. Even if the guild wins, there would be no merit, so it would be better to ignore him. Sueron, after hearing the word ignore, angrily asks his subordinate if she's joking, standing up and slamming the table, asking what would happen to the dragon sword and the black skull's reputation. The player then suggests they set a date for a duel and beat up the protagonist altogether. The master begins to consider the possibility of gathering everyone against Ali Boss to end things once and for all, but another player logs directly into the room where they are, saying they all sounded pathetic. Everyone at the table looks straight at him, shocked, and calls him captain. The player named Jung was the internal captain of the New World Guild. He says that despite being under the protection of his guild, they were planning to gang up on a level 30 player. Sueron asks Jung what he's doing there, as it was none of his business. The captain ignores the master and calls for Cholgu, who immediately responds and walks toward him. As he approaches, Jung lands a powerful punch, leaving the player with no reaction. The captain says he did that because Cholgu monopolized the dungeon without reporting to him, and moreover, three Black Skull Guild members had their characters shamefully deleted, which had exhausted his patience. Sueron is paralyzed, watching everything unfold, until the captain approaches and places a hand on his shoulder, leaving him in shock. Jung tells the master to record a response video and proceed with the duel, as he would handle it with dignity, stating that the weak are naturally devoured by the strong. The captain finishes by saying he hoped the Black Skull Guild survives. Meanwhile, Kale was waiting at a restaurant for dinner and noticed his guest arriving. It was Hyunwoo approaching and asking for his name. The manager responds affirmatively and tells the protagonist that he looks much better in person, adjusting his chair. Hyunwoo says the same to Kale, who mentions that ever since they spoke on the phone, he had been thinking about how fluent the protagonist's English was. Hyunwoo says he learned a little in the past and asks if they are going to talk during dinner, once the dishes are on the table. Kale hands the contract to the protagonist, saying it's already the revised version, and asks him to read it carefully. Hyunwoo starts reading, thinking that his friend had told him these were the best possible conditions. He then tells the manager that the contract was what he expected from Nike and looked very good. Kale tells the protagonist to also check the last part, as it was added recently. Hyunwoo begins to read the last part, 
which mentioned the contract duration of two years and that the company would pay $10,000 for every 10,000 subscribers on his channel, with an additional bonus for every 100,000 subscribers. It also stated that he could choose between a rare skill book, a rare class item, and a unique class ingredient every month. The protagonist is surprised to learn that Nike could give him a unique class ingredient every month, meaning he could craft items with secret recipes, like he used to do as Meligod. Knowing all this, and already imagining what he could create, Hyunwoo asks Kale if all those conditions are true. Smiling, the manager confirms and calls him Meligod, sincerely saying that he thought he still wasn't offering enough. Embarrassed, the protagonist says that Meligod is a name he hadn't heard in a long time and starts wondering how Kale discovered his former character. The manager explains that they require the logo to be displayed on the items used, and that they had a stylist who would work with the protagonist, so he should consult with them at least once a week. After discussing a few more terms, Kale asks Hyunwoo about his upcoming plans. The protagonist says he's planning to start streaming next week and had already prepared something big. The manager, excited, thinks it would be big by Meligod's standards, and smiling, says he'll be looking forward to it. After dinner, Hyunwoo heads straight home and, upon arriving, immediately tells his friend, who was there anxiously waiting. Kwan wants to know right away if he had signed the contract. The protagonist signals yes. Then, Young Chan tells him that Black Skull had shared a response video, smiling. Hyunwoo wants to know what the guild's response was. Kwan says that they told him to go to the Yuzma Coliseum in five days, on Monday at 8 p.m. The protagonist hadn't expected that response, but even so, he doesn't watch the video, thinking it would be a waste of time, and instead prefers to go hunting. Already in the game, he heads to the swamp. The protagonist encounters a group of lizard men ranging between levels 60 and 70. As Hyunwoo fought them, he thought that, being level 34, there should be a difference of about 30 levels between them, so he couldn't understand why it was so easy to fight them. He starts to deduce that he had become stronger after receiving the orcs item and LeBron's skill. Since he had only been hunting monsters lately, he hadn't realized how strong he had become. Hyunwoo imagines that the guild master, Suron, is supposedly around level 85 and he had also heard that the average level of the executives is 70. Charging into the attack against the Lizardmen, he thinks he won't lose to the Black Skull Guild members, but planning to win using combat strategy, he believes it's better to get even stronger to avoid any risks. After that, the protagonist played for over 30 hours, taking breaks only occasionally, but always hunting high-level monsters, totaling basically 30 hours of effort. After a tough battle and testing his new item, the Dwarf Sword, the protagonist emerged victorious over the Lizardmen. Sitting next to a creature, Hyunwoo thinks about just checking his stats and going to sleep, as he was very tired. After that, the protagonist pushed himself for three more days, increasing his proficiency and leveling up six more times, reaching level 40. On the day of the duel against the Black Skull Guild players in the Yusma Coliseum, several banners could be seen promoting the combat between Alibos and Black Skull. Some players who frequently visited the Colosseum were chatting among themselves, saying they had never seen the place so crowded before. They also discussed who would emerge victorious in the fight. Some believed the protagonist would be defeated because the guild had more players, while others didn't think so, as Ali Boss wasn't foolish enough to fight all 13 at once and would likely opt for a captain battle, which was obviously better for him. With everyone now on the battlefield, the protagonist, wearing a mask, asks Suron if all 13 members were present, as he was worried they might get scared and run away. The guild master, irritated, says he's glad the protagonist showed up, because now he could kill him and get the dwarf sword back for free. After hearing this, Hyunwoo tells Suron that dying by that sword would be incredibly humiliating, which only infuriates the master further. Then, holding a microphone, the protagonist asks the audience if they were ready to start the battle and thanks everyone for waiting, saying he appreciated all the players who came to watch his duel and promised not to let them leave yawning as they were about to enjoy a great show. His friend Kwan was watching the duel from home, sipping his coffee and thinking about how Hyunwoo had practically become a celebrity by now. The protagonist continued, stating that, as everyone knew, the terms of the combat were winner takes all and character deletion the team battle would begin at that moment. Young Chan, after hearing this, choked on his coffee, thinking that was insane. The protagonist declared that the fight would be Ali Boss versus the Skull Guild. Suron was stunned upon hearing that, as he had been expecting a one-on-one -on -one duel. Still holding the microphone, Hyunwoo said it was now time for the massacre, one against 13. Kwan still couldn't believe he had heard team battle. He then checked his friend's status, level 40, with two titles, 
recognized warrior by Khan and recognized by LeBron. His strength was 70, with an additional 153, agility 90 plus 43, fighting spirit 4 with an additional 50, conditioning 50 plus 100, and magic 50. Meanwhile, in the Colosseum, everyone was shocked by the protagonist's attitude, thinking they might have heard wrong, but no, the team battle was already beginning. A message appeared for Suran to select participants for the duel, but he was apprehensive, wondering what the protagonist could be planning, since the master thought Hyunwoo had no chance in a captain battle. He couldn't understand how Alibos could defeat all 13 at once. In a captain battle, it would be one-on-one, -on -one, but in a team battle, it was one versus all. Suran couldn't stop thinking that something was up. The protagonist tells the guild master to decide the participants, but personally he wanted everyone to join in, as it wouldn't be fun if only a few were sent, making it end too quickly. Suran tells Hyunwoo that he talks too much, but still, suspecting the protagonist might be planning something, he doesn't care much and starts thinking about victory. Then, the participants were chosen. The duel was between Hyunwoo, with a team of one, versus Suran, with a team of thirteen. The countdown to the duel began. The captain was in the stands watching everything, and nearby was Quan. Before the duel began, Quan thought that his friend wouldn't need to come back if he lost. The message, the duel has begun, appeared, and the protagonist was already positioned to start. The guild's vice leader, Chiolgu, approached the master and said that Ali Boss's items looked good, so he asked if he could take them if he defeated him alone. Suran replied that he could take everything except the dwarf sword. Laughing, Chiolgu said that was a promise. The vice leader approaches the protagonist and tells him he's in trouble, claiming his confidence comes only from his items and abilities, but that won't help him win. Standing close, Chilgu points at Hyunwoo, saying they have both level and numbers on their side, so there was no reason for him to think he could defeat 13 players between levels 70 and 80. The protagonist isn't intimidated and asks if he's sure that items and abilities can't beat numbers. Hyunwoo strikes with extreme speed, asking the vice leader why he approached him alone, and with just one blow, he manages to slice him in half. Suran is stunned, witnessing that as Cheolgu was the second-ranked member of the guild, and he was killed so easily. The guildmaster starts to complain that it was a dirty move since they were still talking, but Hyunwoo questions whether the duel hadn't already started. Seogang, one of the Black Skull executives, tells his companion that Alibos shouldn't be underestimated. Sion remarks that he didn't expect the protagonist to be strong enough for the two of them to be necessary. Together, they formed the Seo Seo combo, the best duo in the guild. They attack together, block the spear, and you'd be stabbed by the sword. Block the sword, and you'd be caught by the spear. As they approached to strike the protagonist, they declared that this was the end for him. Timing it perfectly, Hyunwoo dodges their attack with just one movement, and counters by placing his sword at Seo Wan's neck. Before finishing them off, the protagonist criticizes their sword and spear combo, calling it trash, since one of them should have attacked from a blind spot, and their attack was too simple. Hyunwoo notices Seogang about to react, so he kills his companion first. Seogang tries to react quickly, but all he manages to do is watch his friend die. The protagonist swiftly turns and tells his opponent that those who aren't skilled with a spear tend to freeze when you get too close. After that remark, the protagonist easily finishes off Seogang as well, telling Suran that the dwarf sword is amazing. Standing still with the sword on his back, Hyunwoo says, that's three down, and waits for the others to come at him. The players in the Colosseum went wild, even frightening those outside. The audience was impressed by how effortlessly Alibos had defeated three players, and they were already starting to believe he was going to win. The protagonist, thinking of being a bit more dramatic, points his sword at Suran, and asks how they managed to block dungeons and kill other players with such weak combat skills. He says they can't defeat anyone but noobs and tells them to give up, as their characters will be deleted either way. Suran and his allies were shocked by everything that was happening. They hadn't expected such skill. In the stands, the players were shouting for the guild members to attack the protagonist, but it seemed like they were scared, and soon the crowd began calling for them to surrender. Suran and his allies felt humiliated by all the shouting. The guildmaster then realized that the entire crowd was siding with Alibos, who remained calm, knowing it's important to take the lead when fighting multiple opponents. After taking down the first few and showing his skills, the rest would get confused, and even if they hadn't thought they would lose before, they would now get nervous and make more mistakes. The guildmaster's subordinate suggested they all attack the protagonist at once, since there were still ten of them left, but before they could decide anything, Hyunwoo charged at them, asking if they really thought he would give them time to recover. By the time the guild members realized it, it was too late. 
Before they could react, one of them had already been struck down and killed. The protagonist knew that if they couldn't regroup in time, the fight would essentially turn into a series of one-on-one -on -one battles. Hyunwoo had the entire guild in the palm of his hand, thinking this was the price they'd pay for trying to mess with him. Now they'd be part of his video. The players in the stands were astonished, watching as the protagonist easily defeated the guild members, even those who were stronger, making several swift cuts at incredible speed while maintaining perfect battle posture. After a brief distraction from the group, Ali Boss had already taken down seven opponents, leaving only three Black Skull guild members remaining. Suran was shocked by the situation but still refused to give up. The guild master started shouting that it wasn't over yet, insisting that if they won, the other IDs wouldn't be deleted, so the fight was far from finished. GT, the player standing next to Suran, threw his sword down and quit. He told his master that it would be even more humiliating if they lost, but Suran insisted they could still win. Turu, who was the most loyal to her master, also said she would quit, regretting that she had focused too much on levels and items instead of enjoying the arena like she used to. Suran was taken aback by her reaction, especially when she added that she had liked the guild more when they played casually and enjoyed the game. This left the guild master frozen in disbelief. After the messages appeared, player GT surrendered, and player Turu surrendered. Suran no longer knew what to do, and began reflecting on how things had come to this. When he first started the guild, he was just having fun, hunting monsters with his dongsangs. But when had the joy of becoming strong turned into an obsession? It didn't matter how, Suran didn't even know when the Black Skull Guild had become the villain. The crowd went wild after the players surrendered, chanting for the protagonist to kill now. Hyun Woo, the guild master, hadn't expected the players to surrender, so he started to think they might accuse him of being a fraud since it had been so easy. However, he noticed that Suran had not given up and was preparing to fight. The guild master thought to himself that, since it was his fault the guild had ended up like this, he would finish it with his own hands. He then told the protagonist that this wasn't the end of Black Skull. Shaking while holding his sword, Suran declared that even if their characters were deleted, it wasn't the end, as they would start over, and the next time they met, they wouldn't be mere villains. Hyunwoo, ready for the battle, remarked that Suran's attitude was unexpected since he didn't think he would have the will to keep fighting. As they both charged at each other, the protagonist thanked the guildmaster for not running away. That was the battle between Ali Boss and the Black Skull Guild. Hyunwoo won the duel despite being outnumbered. From that day forward, the name Ali Boss spread like wildfire and became synonymous with justice. The protagonist stood victorious like a true champion as messages appeared, announcing his victory in the duel and that rewards would be delivered according to the winner-takes-all terms. Because of this incident, others began to take an interest. Jung, the captain, standing and watching the protagonist, admitted he hadn't expected much from the Black Skull Guild, but didn't imagine they would lose. Adjusting his lens, he thought to himself that Ali Boss would pay the price for having destroyed the guild he managed. However, the protagonist was only thinking about how many items he had now. After the battle, Kale was sitting in a cafe, watching the video of Hyun Woo's duel with the guild. Now he understood why the protagonist had asked him to wait as a fight against 13 players with a character deletion bet was the kind of unexpected content they should expect from Meligod. Had the protagonist told Kale beforehand that he was planning such high-stakes bets, Kale would have advised him not to do it. But after seeing how much the community was talking about the fight, Kale recognized that Ali Boss had gained a lot of exposure and admitted that the protagonist had achieved his goals and even profited from the chaos. Kale was pleased with his hire and continued to think about this while the waiter brought his parfait to the table. As he ate, he wondered what kind of content the protagonist would show him in the future. But whatever it was, he was looking forward to it. Meanwhile, back at Quan's house, the protagonist was furious, watching TV. His friend approached and asked what was wrong, thinking there might have been a problem with the Nike contract after the guild battle. Hyun Woo pointed at the TV and told his friend to look. An interview was on, where a reporter was interviewing Hanbeck asking how she should address him now that he had the nickname Sword after starting to play Arena. Hanbeck, who was full of himself, told the reporter she could call him whatever made her most comfortable since she was his sunbae. Quan, seeing this, was surprised to learn that the protagonist's enemy had become a pro gamer. Irritated, Hyun Woo said that what he just saw reminded him even more of his revenge, and he had already made up his mind after hearing Hanbeck talk in the interview about his goal to become a pro gamer. The protagonist was determined to destroy that bastard in the arena. He stood up and told his friend that he couldn't rest and needed to work harder and become stronger. Then, he logged into arena once again. 
Quan didn't understand why his friend was acting like that and started to worry about him since the protagonist had just logged out of the cube and was already logging back in. Already inside the game, Hyunwoo was at the southern gate of Briggs along with Tangi. Now that he had dealt with the troublesome Black Skull Guild, he could finally continue the main story. And since few people knew about the fourth mission, the protagonist thought that if he gathered enough information, he could monopolize the fifth. Talking to himself, Hyunwoo said that if he wanted to find the Dark Mages in Briggs, a land fighting against the undead, it would be good to team up with a cleric, but he didn't know anyone he could trust. So he decided to go alone for now. Tangi, sitting on the protagonist's shoulder, shouted that his master wasn't alone because he had him. But as always, Hyunwoo ignored his pet and said he didn't know exactly where in Briggs he should go. The protagonist knew that the cemetery was in the south and the dark cave was in the east. The cave was a popular spot due to the large amount of experience dropped by the skeletons, while not many people went to the cemetery because of the ghouls that released poison and were difficult to defeat. This left Hyunwoo uncertain about where would be ideal to start. He decided to head to the cemetery. Upon arriving, after thinking it would be annoying if people saw the main story if he went to the caves, a man approached him from behind and told the protagonist that he shouldn't be walking around alone because he had told him they should walk together. Hyunwoo didn't know why this guy was following him. When they first met, the man had said he was Sino-Korean and was building a farm, and his name was Kim. After seeing that the protagonist's clothes were the same as Ali Boss's, Kim had recognized Hyunwoo at the southern gate and began following him. The protagonist kept walking, trying to shake off the farmer, but Kim kept asking Hyunwoo if he was going to leave him behind. The protagonist replied that he was going to hunt in the cemetery, so he didn't need any help. Hyunwoo wanted to get rid of the farmer because he didn't want rumors spreading in the community. Kim pulled on the protagonist's coat and asked if he was going to kill some ghouls too. Feeling awkward, Hyunwoo answered that he would since it was a good place to hunt because there weren't many players. The protagonist was surprised when the farmer pulled him so easily, even though he had 200 strength. Hyunwoo became curious about how much strength Kim had invested. The farmer asked the protagonist if he was also looking for dark mages. Before Hyunwoo could answer, Kim laughed and asked if the protagonist was curious about how he knew all of this. Hyunwoo, looking at the farmer, began to wonder how he knew about this mission, and also thought that Kim might be someone following the main story. Kim hugged the protagonist and said he also had some business with the mages, so they should team up because he knew where they were and wouldn't slow him down. Embarrassed, Hyunwoo asked the farmer if he really knew. Kim, squeezing the protagonist, said he knew a lot, and was suggesting this because he knew how strong the protagonist was. The farmer also said he had already mastered his second part. Feeling suffocated, Hyunwoo tried to talk more with Kim, as he was starting to find him suspicious, but deduced that if Kim wanted to harm him, he would have already done so, and if it came to that point, Hyunwoo could escape easily. After removing the farmer's arm from around his neck, the protagonist said they would team up to find the mages. Smiling, Kim said he had made a good choice. When they reached a tomb, the farmer told the protagonist that this was the dark mage's hideout. Hyunwoo remarked that it just looked like a tomb. Kim told the protagonist not to rush and to wait a little. He would see. The farmer activated an item and asked Hyunwoo if he recognized it. The protagonist was impressed because it was the gauntlet of the monk Liru. Kim explained that he had received it as a birthday reward the famous second-class monks, among whom the strictest were those from the Sun Temple, the Liru monks. Now, with the item, the farmer delivered a powerful punch to the tomb. Meanwhile, the protagonist thought that for this to happen, there had to be some absurd requirement, as one couldn't change classes unless recognized by the head monk, and it was said that not many people had that class. Now, knowing this, Hyunwoo was sure that the farmer wasn't just any player. After the powerful punch, Kim told the protagonist that he had opened the passage, but immediately, undead began to appear. The farmer wasn't phased and started to defeat them easily. Hyunwoo was impressed watching how his new companion fought, showing he truly was a Liru monk, as his punches were clean yet powerful. The protagonist had never heard Kim's name, but now, seeing him up close, he couldn't understand why Kim wasn't famous, being that strong. As he watched the farmer destroy the undead, a monster attacked the protagonist, who easily defeated it with his sword, reminding himself that now wasn't the time to admire him, as the priority was completing the scenario. After Hyunwoo started fighting the undead, Kim was impressed by his movements, finding the speed at which he defeated the monsters fascinating. The farmer began to remember Jung, who had told him that he was curious about the man who had wiped out the Black Skull Guild. The protagonist still didn't know it, but Kim was the master of the New World Guild, which was allied with Black Skull. The farmer told Hyunwoo that he liked him because he seemed promising, 
Kim didn't even care about the undead approaching him, some even biting his body, as he pondered what to do with the protagonist now. But those creatures were nothing to Kim, who, just by flexing his muscles, destroyed all those clinging to his body. Meanwhile, he watched Ali Boss finish off the remaining undead. Inside the hideout, a mage was killed by the duo, who stood over him as he died. After the message appeared, you defeated an apprentice dark mage receiving experience. The protagonist told Kim that he had done a good job, but he was still expecting to find stronger mages, since that one was only an apprentice. Even after Hyunwoo defeated a dark mage, the mission wasn't over. The Briggs investigation quest, rumors suggest the undead have invaded the metropolis of Briggs. Discover the truth behind the rumors for LeBron was of the MS class, and the objective was to defeat the dark mages, with the reward being imperial contribution. The protagonist thought that the number of mages was still a question mark, and knew he'd have to defeat more, especially seeing how the farmer was acting. Hyunwoo pondered how to get rid of him now that they had already defeated one mage. As they walked, the protagonist thought about what he should do, thinking that he could be at the top of the rankings based solely on his abilities. For now, Hyunwoo didn't mind keeping a good relationship with the farmer. Kim, on the other hand, thought about how careful the protagonist was, and figured Hyunwoo would probably become guarded if he asked him to join his guild, but also thought it would be strange if he was already in one. So, Kim decided to leave the protagonist with a good impression. Still walking, Hyunwoo said he had to go, because he had planned to hunt with a friend, but he was running a little late. Kim told the protagonist that he should go, as friends were important, and he didn't want to hold him up. Hyunwoo ran off, thanking the farmer for his hard work. The farmer just watched the protagonist running and thought about how it felt like being someone who lacked the courage to confess. He then decided to call the guild captain, opening the call window. Jung responded, saying he had received Kim's message. The farmer told the captain to stop keeping an eye on Ali Boss. Confused, Jung asked why Kim was saying that. With little patience, the guildmaster said he wouldn't repeat himself and that Jung shouldn't think about revenge or anything like that. Smiling, Kim said the protagonist had already become his Dongseng, and he was waiting to meet him again and would make sure Hyunwoo joined them. Meanwhile, on the arena streaming platform A World, there was a paid playback option. The price was set by the uploader, and people could pay to experience the video in their cubes. It's a high-tech option that allows the player to experience all sorts of angles. Kang logs into his channel to see if the duel against Black Skull had already gained a large number of views. The protagonist notes that he had a total of 1,889 views and 10,029 in the cube. Kong is amazed, seeing that, since views were worth 50 cents each, multiplying by 10,000 meant $5,000 from just one video. The protagonist is astonished at how much money Black Skull had made for him. Hyunwoo begins to look at the cube, where he spent most of his time playing. His friend opens the door and asks what he wants to eat. Kwan sees Kong kneeling, thanking the machine, and doesn't understand anything. Back in the game, the protagonist opens the mission window to find out exactly how many dark mages he needs to defeat. He realizes the number is unknown, so he still doesn't know whether he has to kill two, three, or even ten of them. In front of the dark cave, there are a lot of players around. Still at the cave entrance, Hyunwoo, deciding where to start, wonders what would happen if someone recognized him now that he was quite famous. A player recognizes the protagonist and calls out to him. Immediately, Hyunwoo's eyes begin to shine, thinking that a fan had recognized him. But when he looks, he realizes it's actually his old friends. The player, accompanied by someone else, recognizes the protagonist's face and approaches. Hyunwoo sees that it's Yuri and Yongjun. The player says it's been a long time since they've seen each other and that she never imagined they'd meet here. Yongjun, smiling, asks how Hyunwoo has been. The protagonist, embarrassed, says that indeed it's been a long time. He never expected to run into Yuri in the arena. Yuri asks Hyunwoo if he's hurt or has a problem because he's acting so strangely. Yuri and Yong Jun are siblings of Young Chan, the protagonist's best friend, so they've been close since childhood. But the reason Hyunwoo feels nervous around Yuri isn't because she's his friend's younger sister. The girl was holding the protagonist's arm, which left him shaken. She says she heard that he's living with her brother now. Hyunwoo, almost voiceless, replies that he is. Yuri, in a flirtatious tone, tells the protagonist that he's now part of the family. Hyunwoo was shaken because she had confessed to him in the past. The protagonist narrowly escaped the situation, but ever since he's always overthought everything the girl does or says. Hyunwoo feels inhibited around Yuri and can barely respond to her. Yongjun notices everything happening and finds it depressing to witness the scene, telling his sister to stop bothering Hyunwoo, who is already embarrassed. 
The girl laughs, making the protagonist even more uncomfortable. Yuri playfully sticks out her tongue and says she sees Hyunwoo as a friend. Seeing how the protagonist is acting, Youngjun asks if he's going to hunt in the dark cave. If so, he suggests forming a group, as their friend couldn't log into the game. Hyunwoo is surprised by the invitation and doesn't say anything. Youngjun explains that they always play as a group of three, and their friend was a warrior, so the protagonist could trust them. Yuri insisted that Hyunwoo join them. The protagonist quickly realizes they don't know he's Ali Boss or his story in the game. With Quan always looking out for him, the protagonist decides to play with them for a bit. Inside the cave, Hyunwoo tells the group to prepare for battle, as they had encountered skeleton warriors. Yuang Jun, being an archer, readies his arrow, while his sister, a priestess, prepares to cast her magic. The protagonist stands on the front line for close combat, but before he can do anything, he's surprised as the siblings defeat the creatures before he can make a move. The protagonist realizes that the two are quite skilled. Initially, he had doubts since they were a group of three, but seeing how well they did in the first fight, Hyunwoo concludes that they will be able to finish the undead dungeon. Yongjun's arrows were precise, and he could shoot quickly. The archer used only one arrow per skeleton. Yuri, on the other hand, timed her buffs well, so that neither her brother nor the protagonist would run out of them. Hyunwoo found this responsibility quite difficult, and acknowledged that the girl had a good reaction time with shields, so he admitted that he could take them on the mission. While paying attention to his companions, the protagonist didn't notice a skeleton approaching him. Just as the creature was about to attack, Yuri cast a protection shield to prevent Hyunwoo from being hurt. She shouted at the protagonist, telling him to stop being careless, saying it was hard to deal with him. Embarrassed, Hyunwoo stayed silent near her. After defeating all the creatures, Yuri and her brother listened as the protagonist mentioned the instance dungeon, noticing that they didn't quite understand what he meant. Hyunwoo explained that he had received a mission to defeat dark mages, and that an instanced dungeon would appear inside the dark cave, though he decided to hide the fact that it was part of the main story. He then asked the siblings how long they planned to stay in the game. Youngjun replied that they'd be around for about eight hours. The protagonist said that would be enough time for them to complete the mission, and asked if they'd be willing to join him. Excited, the siblings agreed, knowing that instanced dungeons offered great rewards, so they were eager to go. Laughing, the protagonist said they would all have to work hard to find it, though internally, he thought it would be a hellish hunt. An hour had passed, and they were still fighting skeleton warriors. Three hours in, the undead hadn't stopped appearing. After seven hours of searching and hunting, Yong Jun was already exhausted. In front of a basement, the archer told the protagonist that they had been searching for the dungeon for seven hours and were starting to think it didn't exist. Hyunwoo insisted that it had to be somewhere, and that it did exist. Yong Jun said it felt like they had already explored the entire cave. So, the protagonist asked the boy if he wanted to take a break. Hyunwoo was used to playing for long periods, but seeing how tired the archer was, he realized that Yong Jun was really worn out. Unexpectedly, however, Yuri still seemed fine, which made the protagonist think she had a natural talent for arena combat. Yong Jun, exhausted, sat on the ground, saying he couldn't walk any farther and needed to rest a bit. But when he placed his hand on the ground, he noticed that a block moved and the wall started to open, leaving him quite startled. Then a message appeared. You have discovered the apprentice dark mage Adele's laboratory. The protagonist, along with Yuri, was surprised to see the passage and told the archer he had done a great job. Yong Jun was slumped on the stairs, unable to say much since he was both exhausted and had just taken a fall. Descending the stairs, the group arrived at the apprentice mage's laboratory. Adele was focused on casting a spell, muttering to himself that if his research were recognized, he could advance to become a dark mage. Adele, still an apprentice dark mage, had a plan to expand his army of the undead and take revenge on everyone who had looked down on him. With an eerie laugh, he declared that this was the first step of his plan. The protagonist and his companions had just arrived and heard everything. Hyunwoo asked the mage if he was the one responsible for all the undead. After Adele realized he wasn't alone, the protagonist, sarcastically covering his mouth, thanked the mage for revealing his entire plan. Furious, Adele turned around and asked how they had entered his hideout, gripping his sword. Hyunwoo said that they were tired and would end this quickly. The obsessive mage called the adventurers cowards and said they would regret stepping into his laboratory. Adele extended his hand and said, Pepe. Suddenly, an immense creature burst through the wall, leaving everyone stunned. Seeing this, Adele told the group that they would be eaten by his masterpiece, the giant skeletal bear, and ordered Pepe to devour them. Hyunwoo tells Yuri and Young Jun to attack the mage while he handles the bear. 
The creature quickly lunges to attack, swiping its claw, but the protagonist manages to defend, causing a massive impact. The siblings were startled, thinking something had happened to Hanwu, but they soon realized that the bear had stood up, furious, with its arm completely cut. The protagonist remained in a combat stance and told the siblings not to worry. They needed to act fast because the creature wasn't just a skeleton, so they couldn't afford to mess around. The creature's eyes began to glow intensely, and Yuri was immediately paralyzed by the sight. The monster let out a powerful roar, activating its fear ability. Hyunwoo, covering his ears from the deafening scream, was surprised to discover that the bear could use fear. But a message popped up stating that, thanks to his fighting spirit, the fear of the giant skeletal bear was ineffective. Hyunwoo knew that fear was a crowd control ability used by high-level bosses, and if things went wrong, his group could be wiped out. He began to worry. Were his companions okay? Hyunwoo noticed that Adele was behind the bear, laughing, and he asked the group what they thought of his creature's abilities, but suddenly an arrow struck Adele in the chest. Amid the dust, Young Jun had fired an arrow that hit the mage, protected by the shield his sister had created. Realizing the creature was about to use its ability, Yuri had chosen to protect her brother instead of herself. The protagonist admired Yuri's quick thinking, as she had timed the fear ability perfectly, knowing it would be a control skill, and shielded her brother with an immunity ability. Seeing the girl celebrating her brother's successful attack, Hyun Woo acknowledged Yuri's incredible perception. Adele lay on the ground, writhing in agony with an arrow in his chest. Even on the brink of death, he tried to call his creature by its name, but he no longer had the strength. The mage could only remember Pepe when he was a small bear, and how happy they had been as best friends. The giant monster could sense its creator's death and let out a deafening roar while tears streamed from its eyes. The bear angrily thrashed its paws and roared furiously. Young Jun didn't understand why the bear was enraged because its master had died, but he was starting to feel scared. Meanwhile, the protagonist remained calm and said that now it was the second phase, so it was time to bring out the big weapons. Hyun Woo summoned Tangy. Once summoned, the pet rushed toward the skeletal bear, asking the protagonist if he had called him because of a problem, but assured him there was no need to worry now that he was there. However, once Tangy saw the size of the monster in front of him, he ran in the opposite direction, frantically heading toward Young Jun and Yuri. Tangy began screaming at the protagonist to kill the creature as quickly as possible. Hyun Woo replied that he understood and asked Tangy to buff him. After the pet used his ability, the protagonist gained increased strength and constitution, receiving the spirit of the bear, along with a defense boost, and his stamina began regenerating constantly thanks to the blessing of the forest. Now stronger, Hyun Woo charged at the furious skeletal bear. Meanwhile, Yuri hugged Tangy, calling him cute. The protagonist was fighting the massive creature, using all his abilities. Tangy, meanwhile, begged the girl to put him down because she wouldn't stop squeezing him, asking him what his name was. Even Young Jun was starting to take a liking to the protagonist's pet, the puppet bear. Despite seeing its master struggling to defeat the enormous monster, screamed at the protagonist to help him, as the siblings wouldn't stop teasing him, especially Yuri, who even wanted to take Tangy for herself. Blocking another attack from the skeletal bear, Hyun Woo scolded his pet, asking if he couldn't see that they were in the middle of a battle. He also reminded the siblings that they had taken care of the mage just like he had told them. Then, the protagonist finished the fight by using the gigantic strength ability, which temporarily boosted his strength stats. Hyun Woo immediately landed a powerful blow on the creature, which was unable to block the attack. Now, the protagonist seizes the opportunity and unleashes a series of attacks, leaving the giant bear no chance to react. This was Hyun Woo's finishing move, a fatality on the skeletal bear, which let out a loud roar as its blood spurted out. After the barrage of strikes, the protagonist took a deep breath, seeing that he had finally defeated the monster, which fell next to its master, lying on the ground with an arrow lodged in its chest. Tears fell from Pepe's eyes again as it tried to touch its master one last time before dying. The group watched the entire scene unfold, and the protagonist even felt a bit bad witnessing that moment. A message appeared. You have defeated the giant skeletal bear, leveling up, stamina, and magic restored. Hyun Woo noticed he also received a notification, saying he had completed the mission Defeat the Dark Mages two halves, so he knew he had to return to LeBron to finish the mission. The protagonist also received Adele's research journal. Yong Jun asked Hyun Woo what they should do with the items they had looted. The protagonist wanted to know what they were. The archer explained that the Dark Mage dropped a staff and a magic skill book, and the bear had dropped a strange orb. Hyun Woo took the orb and said he would take it for evaluation since he wasn't sure what it was. But after looking closely, 
he started to realize that he didn't expect to find something like that in this place. It was something incredible. So, the protagonist said the orb was enough for him, and the siblings could keep the rest. Yuri told Hyunwoo that it was his mission, so he could keep everything. Youngjun also added that since Hyunwoo had handled the hardest parts, he agreed with his sister. Ruffling the boy's hair, Hyunwoo told him it was fine. They could keep the item as a kind of allowance, since it had been so long since he'd seen them. With everything settled, the protagonist said it was getting late, and they should log out. The siblings listened to Hyunwoo and began exiting the game. The protagonist, however, felt a little uneasy about not mentioning how personally valuable the orb was to him. The next day, the protagonist was already at LeBron's mansion to complete the mission. The Great Knight, seeing Hyunwoo return, commented that it had been quicker than he expected and asked how the investigation had gone. The protagonist replied that he had obtained the mage's research journal and handed it over to LeBron. Taking it, the knight said that this would satisfy his majesty. A message appeared. You have completed the Briggs investigation, receiving experience. The protagonist also received 200 imperial contributions and an additional 1,000 gold as a bonus. LeBron began putting on his coat and told Hyunwoo that they should get ready to go. Confused, the protagonist asked the knight what he meant by that. LeBron explained that they were going to meet his majesty, and since Hyunwoo had conducted the investigation, he should be the one to report it. Hyunwoo was surprised to learn that he would meet the emperor, as in the three years that Arena had existed, no one had ever set foot inside the imperial palace of Yusma. The reason was that many guilds were crawling around LeBron, believing that this was related to the main storyline, and they were right. Thus, Hyunwoo became the first player to step inside the imperial palace, receiving the title first to enter the imperial palace. As he walked toward the emperor, the protagonist was in awe of the palace's grandeur. LeBron told Hyunwoo not to be nervous, as his majesty was a good person. Although he held grudges, he was strong and likable. The protagonist assured the knight he understood, but began to wonder why the emperor held grudges and if he really seemed nervous. Now that he was in the imperial palace and knew it was the center of the main storyline, the protagonist pondered whether the emperor could be a valuable source of items. Upon reaching the main door, LeBron told Hyunwoo that this was where his majesty resided and that the emperor already knew the protagonist was an adventurer, so there was no need to be overly formal. When the door opened, Hyunwoo was astonished by the sight of where the emperor lived. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, and like the video. Thank you.